That is the look inside the 2019 NFL Draft Theater as we are just moments away from Commissioner Roger Goodell opening up this party and saying the words that Arizona has known for a while. The Cardinals are on the clock. Hello, massive humanity. Glad you're with us. <laughs> look at that crowd. It is going to be one heck of an evening, and we are excited to be here with you as football fans have waited for this little taste of what is going on. So as we get set, what's the most intriguing thing, Lewis, you're looking for here? You know what, I'm watching pick three with the New York Jets. That's going to be the hot spot for this draft early on, right? We're going to see if a team's going to try and get up into that spot and see if they want to pick one of these quarterbacks. And I'm watching to see where my guy Dwayne Haskins goes. Yep. I'm looking for the defensive tackles. Quentin Williams, Ed Oliver, Dexter Lawrence, Christian Wilkins. When are the big guys going to come off the board? Ed Oliver is the only guy in this draft that has Aaron Donald potential. Who's going to get up and take him? And, Boog, I'm looking at Oakland, the Raiders, and John Gruden sat there yelling at me for all those years. <laughs> what is he doing? 4, 24, and 27. Now with Mike Mayock is the GM to battle it out with John. He's going to yeah. take a running back is what he's going to do, <laughs> man. He may well. for you. Listen, despite me. Gruden used to be here. Mike Mayock used to be over there on the NFL Network set. It all comes together. And as always, we do this in homage to Chris Berman, who got us all going all those years yeah. ago. We love you, Boom. Meanwhile, here's the commissioner, Roger Goodell. Good evening, Nashville. Welcome to Music Skinny. Home of the 2019 NFL Draft. Tonight, we officially welcome the next generation of players in celebration of the NFL's 100th season. Before we get started, we have a special announcement that will help launch new memories for one NFL fan. I'm joined by three remarkable men who will assist with this moment. Hey, Marcus, you want to say something to your hometown crowd? How's it, Nashville? Welcome to the NFL Draft. Enjoy yourself. Let's go. Also joining us are Hall of Famers Joe Green and Tim Brown. All three of these men embody excellence on and off the field and represent greatness across generations of NFL history. Guys? All right, all right. Tonight, as part of NFL 100, we are announcing the greatest prize in the history of professional sports. One fan is about to win two season tickets for the next 100 years. Thousands of incredible fans around the world showed us their passion for their team and how generations of families have been connected through football. With us here tonight are the three finalists. I'm here. And the winner of NFL season's tickets for the next 100 years, that's what I said, 100 years, representing the New York Giants, Greg Hampton.
Congratulations, Greg, to you and your family. You will enjoy NFL history together for decades to come. Now, you guys ready to get started? The 2019 NFL Draft is now officially open. The Arizona Cardinals are on the clock. Well, the Arizona Cardinals are on the clock, but let me just say, I think Greg Hampton suddenly got very interested in who the Giants are taking at 6 and 17. <laughs> no question. So congratulations to the Hampton family for literally generations, 100 years of season tickets. But right now, guys, it is all about Arizona. Cliff Kingsbury is the new head coach. There he is inside their draft room, along with the owner, the Bidwells. Cliff Kingsbury has basically tried to recruit Kyla Murray for seven years when he was coming out of Allen High School to go to Texas Tech. Instead, he went to A&M, and then he went on to Oklahoma. So here are the quarterbacks that Cliff Kingsbury, who was a quarterback himself at Texas Tech, taking a look at some of the coaches that he's been linked to over his years in the coaching ranks. When he was at Houston, Case Keenum, of course, has now uh, just moved on from the Denver Broncos. Johnny Manziel at Texas A&M. Baker Mayfield at Texas Tech, but Mayfield transferred away. Future Hall of Famer, Patrick oh, Mahomes. Oh, the Ferrari. The Ferrari is there as well. And now, of course, he may be hitching his wagon to Kyla Murray. And, of course, this is all really weird because back in October when Cliff was still the head coach at Texas Tech and they were getting set to play Kyla Murray when he was playing for Oklahoma. He had this to say, having no idea how prophetic this might be when he said it. I've watched him, like I said, since he was a sophomore. I, I've never seen him have a, a poor outing, not one, which at quarterbacks it's, it's impossible to do, but he's done it. And uh, I don't know, I'd take him with the first pick of the draft if I could. I know he's signed up to play baseball, but I, he is a dominant football player. and. Um, I would I would take him with the first pick. <laughs> so that seven year itch may be coming true. So who is Kyla Murray? Well, first of all, he came out of Allen High School outside of Dallas and Texas. Their stadium is $60 million. Just throwing that out there. They won three straight titles or three state titles. Uh, Murray first went to Texas A&M like his father did before him. But as you can see, the numbers were not great. He transferred to Oklahoma and sat and watched Baker Mayfield take them to the college football playoffs and win a Heisman Trophy. He was then picked ninth overall by the Oakland A's in the Major League Baseball draft. And then, lo and behold, went out and played, won the starting job, and as you can see, balled out and won Oklahoma its second straight Heisman Trophy. And there is Kyla Murray, resplendent in his homage to Leonardo DiCaprio in The Great Gatsby. So, do we think this is the right choice, knowing the marriage between Cliff Kingsbury and Kyla Murray? It doesn't really matter if it's the right choice. It's all about the marriage, though, that you're talking Correct. about. Look, if you're looking at this organically, right, you would, think, you would look at the Arizona Cardinals, you would say this. Look, their offensive line was one of the worst in the NFL last year in 2018 as far as pass protection win rates. Their defensive line gave up more explosive plays, plus 10, plus 20-yard runs, if any team in the NFL or close to any team in the NFL. So what should you do? You draft Quinn and Williams. If there was an offensive lineman that you could get, you draft him. But it doesn't matter. See, this is about why did you hire Cliff Kingsbury, right? right? And what does Cliff Kingsbury need in order for you to look smart, make an investment in him? That leads you to Kyler Murray. Otherwise, as you've said, we may not even be talking about right. this. I'll tell you what, it was a curveball hire of Cliff Kingsbury. Right. And because of that, Kyler Murray doesn't have to worry about hitting a Major League Baseball curveball. He can go right into the National Football League. And I think the Kingsbury hire with Kyler Murray, not, and you think about college coaches, not respecting pass protection enough coming from college to the NFL. You think about Josh Rosen. Immobile pocket passer. Can he hold up from a durability standpoint? Murray, tremendously mobile. I think he, he sees the field so well, both from a defensive standpoint and knowing where those guys are around him. He can obviously slide as a baseball player. Right. He, he can play smart. I think it was the only common sense move the Arizona Cardinals could make. Once you hire Kingsbury and there's Kyler Murray, you can't worry, well, we already had Rosen. Well, that was before Kingsbury was hired. So you can't tie yourself to Rosen. You draft Murray, you trade Josh Rosen, you get what you can, and you move on with Kyler Murray, a quarterback. Bill Parcell said it best. 
If you want me to cook the meal, yep. at least let me shop for some of the groceries. This is Cliff Kingsbury going out and handpicking the guy that he wants. And if you're going to run this offense, you need a guy that's twitchy in the pocket that can move around. I don't know if it'll work. We don't know if Cliff Kingsbury's going to work. But one thing about it, they hired Cliff Kingsbury. So to answer your question, is this the right pick for Cliff? Absolutely. Yeah, listen, we don't know if Kingsbury's going to work. Exactly. I mean, we he don't. had a losing record it's at Texas Tech. But the issue with Kyler is not production. It's not his arm. It's his height. Listen, we have not seen a lot of quarterbacks his height taken. Now, look, Jamarcus Russell might be the biggest bust in this for the NFL draft, so let's not go by that. <laughs> but you see these recent quarterbacks selected and their heights, 6'4", 6'3", Jared Goff. Baker snuck in there at just over six. And Kyler Murray couldn't get on the roller coaster. A little bit, though. But he does compare favorably in his measurables, including his height. To a guy that's done pretty well in the NFL, his name is Russell Wilson. If you look at those numbers, uh, Kyler's just a little shorter. He weighed a little more at the combine. Uh, and we'll see what happens. They both have a baseball background. Is that a fair comparison, Mel? Yeah, one long ago, Russell Wilson was the 75th pick in the third round. And now Kyler Murray may be the number one pick overall just a few years later. I said months ago, Kyler Murray's the number one pick. First call should be to Russell right. Wilson, then to Patrick Mahomes. Thank them because because of those two, particularly Russell Wilson, he's in a position to make history tonight and be at the first pick in the draft. And we said he would have made history being just a first or second round pick, right. let alone the number one pick overall. You know, if you look at this, there's 32 starting quarterbacks in the National Football League. There's only one under six feet tall, and that's Russell Wilson. I don't think that's coincidence. It's hard to play the position when you're under six feet tall. So is it going to be hard for him? He's going to have to learn to play from under center. He hasn't done that a lot at Oklahoma. It's going to be hard to do this job. That's why it has to be the right system. If Arizona and Cliff Kingsbury were not picking at number one, we wouldn't even be talking about Kyler Murray. So the fit in the system makes this pick right. You know, in regards to his height, though, look, the league is such that it needs to be kicked in the rear end sometimes in order to change some of its thinking. Right. Because there's evidence out there that says that a guy who's 5'10 can play in the NFL if you focus on some of the things that some of the other quarterbacks who are sub six feet or just over six feet focus on. And that's number one, pocket mobility and finding throwing lanes. You can see it right here. Look, Kyler is trying to hit the shallow cross, but he has, look, his throwing window that he's looking through is not what he needs it to be. So what does he do? He slides to his left, goes to his right, puts it right on the money, catch and run situation. This is what Russell does in Seattle. He's going to find throwing windows. He's not always going to find them. It's not always going to be perfect, but he finds them enough to where now he's the richest player in the National Football League. So here, what does he do? Just slides a little bit, finds a throwing window, puts it on his guy. Here, how about maximizing your height? Getting up on your toes, hey. you having a nice high release point and getting the ball up and down to your wide receiver. Look, Drew Brees is a bad dude now. We'd all agree on that. I think we'd all want to trade for Drew Brees if we need a quarterback. He does it. He gets up on his toes and looks out of the bottom of his face mess. How about throwing, changing your arm angle just so you can get the ball out quick and make some of those unique plays that only a few you can make. Hey, the future Hall of Famer, right? The Ferrari. Yeah. He can bend it around corners like a magician. I'm not saying Kyler Murray is Pat Mahomes, so let's calm down for okay. a second. But he can do it. So let's point to the positive here of why I think this kid can succeed regardless of scheme. I got you. Here's one thing that's interesting. For all those things he does in his quickness, 91% of his throws were from the pocket last right. year at Oklahoma. Uh, let's go to Morton Adam for more on this. What are you guys hearing? Thanks, Trey. Listen, Steve Kahn, the general manager of the Cardinals, that team was calling Quinnen Williams of Alabama, defensive tackle, and Nick Bosa, the Ohio State defensive end, calling their reps to say you're still in the discussion for number one but the expectation around the league and in, in the top ten is that they will absolutely take Kyler Murray no oh, by the way former Oklahoma coach Bob Stoops has joined current Oklahoma coach Lincoln Riley here I don't think they came here to see Kyler Murray drop and once they take Kyler Murray the question becomes what happens to Josh Rosen the three teams the Cardinals have spoken to this offseason are the Giants, the Dolphins, and the Chargers. But Rosen has not been a priority for any of them. He's a backup plan, depending on what happens in the first night of the draft. So tonight's for Kyler Murray, and tomorrow night may be for Josh Rosen, Trey. All right, Mort Adam, thanks very much. We just had a quick peek in the Cardinals uh, draft room there. Cliff seemed to have a wry smile on his face. <laughs> yeah. He sure did. I, I'm not saying. I'm just saying he seemed to have a wry smile on his face. Listen, one thing we do know about what Kyler did in, in college, 
all of his draft eligible linemen are going to get drafted. There you go. He had an unbelievable yes. offensive line yes. in Oklahoma. Yes. He's not going to have that in Arizona. Is that a concern at all? Well, sure, it's a concern. Look, they've tried to address it a little bit as far as adding some veteran players like J.R. Sweezy, Marcus Gilbert, to play left guard and right tackle, respectively. They know it's a problem. They know they couldn't run the ball last year either. That's another thing you don't want to bring a young quarterback into a situation where you can't run the ball for a good average per carry and you can't protect him. So I guess his mobility may help him a little bit until proven otherwise. I'm just saying from a height perspective, look, I, I'm just not caught up on all that. I understand the league is about precedent, right, Mel? The league is about drafting profiles that have had success in the past because you know what? If you draft a guy who doesn't fit the ideal profile and you're wrong, yep. we are going to come down on you. Your owner is going to come down on you, and GMs don't like that. That's how you get fired. All right. We'll see what's going on there. It appears that the pick might be in. And if it is, there is going to be history made not only on the player that's taken, but also on the team that's taken. So if this goes the way it feels like it's going. <laughs> oh, it, it's going that way. We I think may, we all know that. We may have a couple of firsts for you in the draft, and, and we love those kind of situations with the NFL draft. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you see the sign, and look at that crowd. The pick is in. Here is Commissioner Roger Goodell. With the first pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Arizona Cardinals select Kyler Murray, quarterback, Oklahoma. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be the first to say it. Arizona has found their Murray. Kyler Murray now makes history. The Oklahoma Sooners become the first team ever to have back-to-back -back number one picks at the same position. Quarterback, Kyla Murray, have followed up Baker Mayfield as a Heisman Trophy winner, and now he follows him up as the first pick in the draft. Only once before in draft history have we had one school have the top pick in back-to-back -back years. That was in the 60s when offensive lineman Ron Yerry was followed by O.J. Simpson. And now we have back-to-back -back quarterbacks out of Oklahoma. And in making nice, this man. pick, Arizona, now becomes only the second team in the common draft era to take a back-to-back -back quarterback with their number one pick. The last time they did it, the Baltimore Colts fell. There you go. 82, Art Schleister, 83, John Elway, and of course, Elway never played a single snap for the Baltimore Colts. Mel, what made him the number one pick? Had John Elway played, he may have never moved out of Baltimore, but I think you look at the situation like Kyler Murray, now he said, okay, his first call should be to Russell Wilson. Now he's in the same division with Russell Wilson and Jared Goff, and now a healthy Jimmy Garoppolo. Boys, that could be fun watching those teams compete. You say he didn't deal with adversity, he did against Alabama. They were down big. He brought them back. Not even having Hollywood Brown available is outstanding wide receiver. You watch him here. This is a highlight reel, a spectacular play. The ability to improvise, the accuracy down the field, the accuracy short, intermediate, the way he will stand in that pocket at 5, 10, and an 8 and still make that accurate throw. I said a couple months ago, if he was 6 feet tall, there wouldn't even have been any debate about who would be the number one pick in this draft. The fact that once he was 5'10 and changed, he got close enough to Russell Wilson to say, if I'm Arizona, let's just get him. And then the Kingsbury factor was the reason why it was a guarantee. Kyler Murray now all of a sudden will have to prove that as the number one pick with all that pressure and all those expectations, he can do what Russell Wilson has done in the NFL, which to me, and I said it when Russell was drafted, guys, he was the test case for quarterbacks under six feet. He opened the door for Kyler Murray. You know, and I feel really, really good for Cliff Kingsbury because when you bring the air raid offense to the National Football League, you want to have your guy. Now he has his guy. Now he's got to go out and prove that this offense can succeed in the National Football League. So it's all come together for Cliff Kingsbury in Arizona. You got your guy. You're the head coach. Now it's on you, Cliff. Can you succeed in the NFL? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I necessarily feel good for him, but I am. <laughs> and, I'll you, but I, and I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. And I don't mean that negative at all. Right. Right. I don't right. Mean that, but I'll tell you this. Look, the number one thing that you would worry about by, from a Cliff Kingsbury coach offense is this: Can you teach this guy? pass protection yes. and how to protect yes. himself. You do yes. not want to rely on his athletic ability yes. to keep him out of harm's way. Can you teach him
how to talk to the offensive lineman and upgrade the offensive line good enough to where he doesn't have to be running all around yep. so he can go ahead and justify all those pocket passing statistics that yep. he put up in Oklahoma. Because if you can't, yeah. then Josh Rosen's going to be sitting there going wherever he winds up. See? <laughs> all right, so here's what's interesting, right? We just talked about Murray and Oklahoma making history and Arizona making history with taking that quarterback in back-to-back -back years. Lincoln Riley, head coach, and Oklahoma just made history. We've never had a coach do this. So, Lincoln Riley, good luck and get ready, Jalen Hurts. I guess <laughs> no we're question. going for a three-peat next year. <laughs> okay, for more, let's go down to Susie Calver for this DXL interview with the number one pick in the draft. Kyler, when did you first believe that you could be the number one overall pick in the NFL draft? It's, it's been a dream of mine since I was a kid. Um, you know, all the hard work. Everyone who's been in my corner has pushed me to get here. You know, I can't thank them enough. I thank God and just, I mean, it, it, this, is, this is surreal. Cliff Kingsbury first started recruiting you when you were just a sophomore in high school and you guys always stayed in touch. What kind of a combination do you believe you can be in the NFL? I feel we can be very dangerous. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's one of the best in the world at calling plays and, and, and offensive mind. So uh, for me, I'm just, I, I can't wait to get up there and get with him. It's been a long time coming. Uh, and I know, I hope you know, he feels the same, so. Well, for something we all thought was coming, man, yeah. you were on the phone for a long time. What were those calls like? Honestly, I I, I kind of blacked out a little bit. I can't even tell you what they were saying half the time, but uh, it, it was it's something I'll never forget for sure. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Man, a long time coming, but Cliff Kingsbury got Thank his you. man. Susie, Kyla, thanks very much. By the way, Kyla's going to face his former college roommate, Baker Mayfield, week 15, we believe when the Cardinals take on the Browns. And here is the not so spectacular uh, history of Cardinals quarterback selected in the first round. Steve Pisarkowitz, 1977. Kelly Stoffer, who by the way sat out a year, Mel if I'm not mistaken, and did not want to play there. Matt Leinert, 10th overall. Josh Rosen now we believe will be moved on. And Kyla Murray, number one overall. So we move on from number one to number two. The San Francisco 49ers are on the clock and we had a historical pick for many reasons with number one. We may have another historical pick with number two. That is the man we believe is going potentially Nick Bosa. His father John Bosa 16th overall in 1987. His uncle Eric Kubaral 16th overall the same slot to the same team the Miami Dolphins in 1988 and of course his brother Joey third overall a few years ago. So ladies and gentlemen, the pick is in. Is it Bosa time by the Bay? Let's find out. With the second pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the San Francisco 49ers select Nick Bosa. Defensive end, Ohio State. Well, there it is, and there you see his older brother behind him there. You have to wonder if in some way, shape, or form, the 49ers didn't want to resist making this pick because it's the fourth time in five years they've basically taken a defensive end with their first overall. But this is the Bosa family. There is John with the two boys who, of course, now join him as number one picks in the NFL. This is the boys playing a game in the backyard that they made up. It's called kill the man with the ball. <laughs> How did they ever become defensive players? We never knew. And there, of course, you see that's the father in the middle. By the way, Mel, he still has the boy band hair. I'm just pointing that out. <laughs> and there is Nick showing the inside lining of his jacket. And this is also significant because with the Nick Bosa selection, they become on the defensive side of football when it comes to the draft what the Manning family is on the first side because Archie, Peyton, and Eli became the first family ever that had a father and two sons all taken in the first round of the draft. And now, ladies and gentlemen, meet the defensive Mannings, the Bosas, John in 87, 
Joey in 2016 and Nick in 2019. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, what about Howie Long and his two sons? Yeah, Chris and Kyle were first rounders. Howie was actually a second rounder out of mm. Villanova mm. back in 1985. But there he is. The Bosa family triumvirate is complete. And once again, for the fourth time in five years, the Niners go defensive end, defensive line, edge rusher in the draft. What do we think, Lewis? Well, look, th there's, there's two ways to really improve your past defense efficiency. Look, the 49ers only had two interceptions in 2018. You, you can't win that way. And they allowed 35 pass TDs. There's no corners, there's no coverage players that you would wind up, just, that you could justify taking at the number two overall pick in the draft. So how do you affect the, the pass defense? You get guys who can rush the passer. Nick Bosa is good at that. He certainly is, even though he had that injury that missed most of the season this year for Ohio State. So DXL takes us down to Susie, who's standing by with the latest member of the Bosa family to be drafted in the first round. Well, Nick, Nick one of the ultimate football families, what does this moment represent for you? It's a new journey. I'm so excited to finally be back on a team. Can't wait to get to work, but... This is all the work I've put in since I was seven years old, and it's finally here. Well, it seems like forever since you've been on the field. I mean, what do you want to do when you first join your teammates? Uh, I want to get with my team. I want to kick some butt on the field. I'm so excited to go to work. You know, we always hear about your brother, your dad, but how would you describe what your mom has meant to your journey? I mean, words can't even explain my mom. Uh, She's been the one driving us to practice since I was seven years old, putting my pads in my pants for me. I mean, I love her more than anything. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Susie, Nick, thanks very much. Bosa only played in three games this year, but he had four sacks, a forced fumble, two fumble recoveries, a defensive touchdown, a pass breakup. That's a lot for three games, Boog. This guy can play. Well, he can absolutely play. And what you're getting with Nick Bosa, he's a professional rusher what does that mean he understands angles he understands leverage he can bend and flip his hips we all saw joey bosa let me tell you ladies and gentlemen nick bosa has a little bit more juice and has a little bit more giddy up in his step than his brother joey you're going to see a guy that can come off the corner use his hands exceptionally well get to the quarterback and he can finish and even in sub package you can reduce down and he also plays with power and the ability to shed and make tackles you put him at defensive end and barring an injury, he'll get you 7 to 12 sacks for the next 7 to 10 years. That's the type of player you're getting. You don't have to teach him how to rush. He already knows how to rush. With speed, with power melt, he can do it with the best of them. Yeah, and I think the key for the 49ers is pass rush. They haven't had it. DeForest Buckner stepped up with 12 sacks this year. They traded him for D Ford. Now all of a sudden you add Nick Bosa. You went for a team, couldn't get after the quarterback a few years ago. Then now that a team that's three pass rushers, Fred Warner, you add Juan Alexander. Now your front seven is well fortified with Nick Bosa and a developing DeForest Buckner and D Ford. Now all of a sudden Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray and Jared Goff. Now you got the pass rushers to get after those guys. Really, a really interesting division going yep. forward. So this was a few years ago what we saw from Joey Bosa in 2016. He gave the hug to Commissioner and of course just a few moments ago little brother got to do the exact same thing. Two historic picks to start the 2019 draft. What's going to happen next? Stay with us. Welcome back to the 2019 NFL Draft, presented by Courtyard. Glad you're with us as we are on to the third pick of the 2019 draft in the first round. There's a little rain, but those crowds don't care. They just think of that as a quick shower because they're here for the duration. The Jets are on the clock, and the Jets guys made tons of moves to prepare themselves to have flexibility here. They got their franchise quarterback, Sam Darnold, last year. They picked up Le'Veon Bell in free agency as well as linebacker C.J. Mosley. So what are the Jets going to do at three? Let's check in with Roger Goodell. With the third pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the New York Jets select Quinnen Williams, nose tackle, Alabama. 
Big Baby is off the board. <laughs> His offensive line teammate at Alabama called him a 300 pound bar of soap because he's just so slippery. But this is an unbelievable rise for a guy who basically had one year to play for Nick Saban in Alabama. He originally committed to Auburn. In fact, many of his passwords are still Auburn related because he just doesn't want to go through the hassle of getting rid of them. And of course, his mother passed away from breast cancer in 2010 and he plays for her and thinks of her every single day. And I have to believe that Quinnen Williams is thinking about her right now as he makes the walk of his life. When he was recruited and signed by Alabama, Nick Saban wasn't that sold on Quinnen Williams. He said, wait a minute, we only got Raekwon Davis and Quinnen Williams. They both turned out to be pretty good players. Quinnen turned out to be so dadgum good. He was the third overall pick after only just one year. But Booker, that one year for Quinnen Williams at Alabama was stellar. Well, it was dominant because he came on the field and he showed you he could play in a number of positions. Team versatility is what he brings. He can play in a 4-3 and play over the guard, or you can put him in nose tackle, or you can put him at the 4-I in a 3-4 defense. But what you're getting is a long, lean, versatile player. Look at him right here over the guard, disengaged, pure power. Think of Indama consume when we think of Quentin Williams. Big, powerful player that has quickness and strength, and he can play with both of them. I love the pick. I just wonder, though, if you're the Jets, you have Leonard Williams inside, you need a little edge pressure, but you add what I think is the best player in the draft in Quentin Williams. Yeah, I'm sure Josh Allen, Kentucky was tempting. They obviously had a strong interest. They'd love to add Anthony Barr. Yeah. But now you go with the best player on your board, and that was Quentin Williams. You can make an argument he was the best player and the cleanest player in this draft. You don't have any injury concern. Yes, one-year domination, but that's all you can do. Yeah. He's a third-year sophomore. This is a kid that when the production and the measurables all Don't. come together. And I say measurables, he ran 483 at 303 pounds at the combine. He was incredibly productive. Great kid. I talked to him a couple weeks ago up in Bristol. He said, I want to be complete. I just yeah. don't want to be a sack guy. I want to stop the run. I want to be dominant in all aspects of defensive tackle play. And Lewis, more on that 483. His first 40 time was a 487 yeah. at 303 pounds. And people said, don't run again. He goes, no, I'm good. I want to <laughs> run again. You've got to love the fire of a kid like that because we were blown away with a 487, and then he tops it with a 483. Yeah, th this is a pick that seems to have defensive coordinator Greg Williams fingerprints all over because he's someone who really does believe in interior pressure. Although it's interesting because, you know, you pointed out the fact that, look, their edge rushers, their outside linebackers aren't people who have won consistently. Right. And it's kind of interesting that they went this route. But, you know, look, if you can get pressure up the middle book, you know this. Yes. It really does disrupt the timing. It really just throws quarterbacks off. So it makes sense. I mean, he's a fantastic player. He certainly is. And, by the way, the Jets had never taken a – defensive player with the previous five picks in the top three they have done that now and big baby is now gangrene so for more on what's going on with Quinnen Williams let's go down to Susie Culver hey Susie Quinnen you've been a huge fan of the draft your whole life you watched every one of them yeah, what's man. it like to be going number three overall to the Jets oh uh, man it's just amazing man I'm just ready to work now man uh, I train with Linda Williams man I know Linda Williams a lot man so to get in there, man, with him and somebody I already have a connection with and learn from him and things like that, man, we're going to get the work done. So, You have shared that everything you do in life, you think of what would your mom think about it? And we know she passed when you were 12. Yeah, what do you want to say to her tonight? Uh, that I did it, man, that it's just the beginning. Uh, I got a long road ahead, and I know that she proud of me, but she don't want me to get complacent. She want me to keep going, keep working hard, and finish school and get my degree. So. Well, Jets fans certainly want to hear that. And there's a lot more for mom or Quisha to be proud of. There's an older brother in the green room who will likely be drafted this weekend, Trey. All right, Susie, Quinnen, thanks very much. So congratulations to Quinnen and the Jets. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Raiders are on the clock. The first of their three first-round picks they have in 2019. Of course, the Raiders experience very rough waters as we look at a GMC professional grade moment. I the ship be sinking most of these years. Sorry. Uh, they shipped off two of their biggest stars. Khalil Mack, who by the way went there and had a half sack less for the Bears than the entire Raiders team did in 2018. And then of course they shipped Amari Cooper to Dallas. They did pick up Antonio Brown 
for only a third and a fifth round pick. So if we're ever, ever going to look at a player that matches a need, it's the Raiders and maybe Josh Allen. The Raiders had 13 sacks as a team. To put that in perspective, as we look at the Legend Sports Bar in Las Vegas, Nevada, the second worst sack total in the NFL in 2018 was 30. They had 17 fewer sacks than every other team in the NFL. Does Josh Allen make all the sense in the world here? Man, it absolutely does. Look, he's fallen right into their lap. Look, they addressed the inside positions on their defensive line last year with the drafting of Maurice Hurst and P.J. Hall. Right. Okay, they're not spectacular. They're not game changers. But they have Arden Key on the outside, and that's it. Yeah. They need a guy like Josh Allen who, quite honestly, dropped in coverage last year over 50% of the time, mm. which is, I mean, over, just under 50% of the time, which is amazing to me. And he still racked the kind of totals that he racked up as far as rushing the passer. This one's easy to me. You just turn this one in. You know, my only concern about Josh Allen, I think he's a 3-4 outside linebacker, which is why I think the Jets were tempted to take him, which is why he dropped in coverage at Kentucky. John Gruden, my former coach, we had a guy that lined up next to me named Warren Sapp. Yeah. He's intrigued by that three technique that can hit the B-gap. So if it's not Josh Allen here at this pick, don't be surprised if it's Ed Oliver maybe at the pick, that three technique that can line up over the guard and hit the B-gap. Yeah, look, Ed Oliver may have been one of the most underutilized and misused defensive Correct. players or just Correct. players, period, right. in this draft. This guy was lining up as a zero nose over and over, and you're watching the film going, <laughs> Is he really yeah, lining exactly. up there? Is that what they're doing At to this 278 guy? pounds. That's right. And oh. was still dominant. For him to get outside to a three technique, it'd be like, hey, like you, set going on free. Yeah. you set me free finally. I mean, yeah, that would make sense here too. Okay, so but here's the problem with Oakland, right? Sometimes they do things that don't make sense. So do we think they'll be conventional or do we think they'll be the Raiders? That's a great question here. Look, look. You win by rushing the passer, yeah. and you win by expl by producing explosive plays on offense. And the only way you can slow down those explosive plays is by rushing the passer. Mm -hmm. You take a big guy here. It's pretty simple. It does seem to be simple, but again, they had that guy in Khalil Mack, and they let him go. And, you know, it, it's weird how sometimes we see these players, Dave, or GM Dave Gettleman in New York, you draft a generational player like Odell Beckham, right. yeah. and then you just want to get a draft pick again for like a 10% chance to get that kind of player. That's the weird part about some of this we've seen this offseason. Yeah, look, a, a lot of times when it comes to accumulating draft picks and building football teams, look, arrogance sometimes does creep into the psyche of guys who do it. Look, I've been there yeah. as far as being a scout. You always think you can find the yeah. next best. There's always someone else. I know Khalil one thing Mack? about John Gruden, Ooh, guys. Tough. Yeah, if he's anything, he's unpredictable. Exactly. Uh, listen, we, we had a few of those moments. Yes, we did. Set, <laughs> Many. No Many. So this is the first of three chances we'll find out if John is traditional or unconventional. The pick is in. Here we go. With the fourth pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Oakland Raiders select Cleland Farrell, defensive end, Clemson. Okay, this is interesting on a couple of levels. <laughs> By the way, Cleland Farrell is a very good player. Yes. He's one of five Clemson defensive linemen that are going to be drafted. Three of them, in all likelihood, are going into the first round. But that Raider fan is like, Wait a minute, I thought we were going to get Josh Allen. So Cleland Furl is a guy from Richmond, Virginia, who knows about dedication to task. His father, Cleavster, served in Vietnam. His mother served in Desert Storm. They come from a military background. He graduated in three and a half years in December. His father, as we said, passed away in 2012. Look, he has first round talent. But we just all thought the first edge rusher might be Josh Allen instead of Cleveland Furl. Well, I think I understand the pick. When you look at a pure 4-3 defensive end in Paul Gunther's defense, he fits that mode as a guy that can stop the run and put his hand down. I think Josh Allen, as we discussed, is more of that stand-up outside linebacker. So they went with the more traditional guy that can play the six technique and also play the five technique. That's what John and Mike Mayock went for. Yeah, look, I understand, you know, what you're talking about philosophically, Book. And look, and he's one of those guys who you're right. When you put him in a six, when you put him in a six eye, he'll stand in there and battle. I just don't know if he gives you the juice that you necessarily need to take care of the passers in this division. 
And I'll tell you that I just don't know if you needed to pay this price right. for this guy. Okay, yeah. we're talking. We're going to make the value argument, which is one of the things we wanted to see what Oakland would do in terms of value. But would they pay the right prices? But if he turns out to be an All Pro, nobody will care. But he has to turn out to be one of those guys who can affect the passers in this division. Yeah, I ask people when I talk to my guys in the NFL, where do you think players will go? With Furl, it was anywhere between 15, 25, 15, even to 32. So this was in the old days. What we call this? A reach. Uh, right. Absolutely. Well, listen, Furl now becomes the highest drafted player in the history of the common draft out of Clemson. Sammy Watkins in 2014 and Gaines Adams in 2007 both went higher. That distinction belongs to Clear Furl. And the saddest person right now is Christian Wilkins, the other Clemson defensive lineman who said, please don't let Cleveland get drafted ahead of me. Sorry, big fella. That's the way the board went down. We are just getting started. The draft is an experience you got to see to believe. This is the 2019 NFL Draft. Presented by Courtyard. Welcome back to Nashville and our continuing coverage of the 2019 draft. We are four picks in. The Tampa Bay Bucks are now on the clock with the fifth overall selection. And let us bring in our good friend Todd McShay from Selection Square. Todd, the board seems pretty wide open for the Bucks at this point. What do you think? I'm still recovering from that pick. I thought Mike Mayock, the GM for the Raiders, was supposed to be the rudder for John Gruden. But they reach for, for Cleveland Farrell there, and, and it provides potentially some opportunity here for Tampa Bay. Now, all along we've thought it's going to be one of the Devons, either, either Devin White from LSU, the linebacker, off the ball linebacker, or Devin Bush from Michigan, both speedsters, today's type of NFL linebacker. But now Josh Allen is available. And you got to remember, they transitioned from the 4-3 to the 3-4 with Todd Bowles coming in. They could use that edge rusher. But do you pass up on the leader and the playmaker at linebacker? This is a tough decision. I'm, I'm not sure that they expected to have all three of these players available when they came on the clock at number five, Trey. Absolutely, Todd. They have to love the way this has fallen in terms of what will be available to them. So as the rain continues to fall, the spirits are still high in Nashville. So we had John Gruden just pick. Since John Gruden left Tampa, it ain't been great. Ten seasons, five coaches. I'm not good at math, but that's two a coach. Some of that John Gruden calls before he left, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's all so true. Playoff appearances, zero. So the Bucks fans here inside have to be happy about the options available to them. The question now becomes, which option did they choose? Let's find out right now from Commissioner Goodell. For Tampa Bay's pick, I'm joined by Casey Reynolds, a Make-A-Wish kid and a huge Buccaneers fan. Casey's been fighting cancer and tonight, his wish is to be granted to announce the opportunity to be granted to announce the Buccaneers' first round pick. We hope this wish gives Casey the physical and emotional strength to face any challenges that come his way. Okay, Casey, now's the time. the fifth pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers select Devin White, linebacker, LSU. Happiness all the way around in the green room for Devin White, the first of the two Devons inside linebackers that may come off the board, and it is. Devin White was recruited at LSU to play a running back. But they said, no, 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 you're going to play linebacker. Turned out to be great. He's a horseman. His horse's names are Daisy May. He also has one named Ricky Bobby. And if you ain't first, you're last. And he's the first inside linebacker off the board, so he's channeling his Ricky Bobby right now. But again, he was recruited as a running back. They said, we're going to make you a linebacker, and that turned out to be a really good idea because he became the first LSU linebacker to win the Butkus Award 
as the best in the business. He led the SEC with 123 tackles, Boog. This guy made plays all season long. He's the best inside linebacker in the draft. Tampa Bay needs a linebacker with Juan Alexander going to San Francisco. And Trey, simply put, he can play sideline to sideline at 240 pounds with 4-4 speed. He's instinctual. He can be a leader. He's going to come into Todd Bowles' defense, that 3-4 team, and he'll be able to line up behind the defensive tackle, Vita Vail, who's going to protect him, and he won't get touched, and he'll be a linebacker like they've never had in Tampa, a guy that can run and hit at 240 pounds. Mel, when opportunity and need present themselves, and Devin White was staring right there, this is the perfect kick for Tampa. Look, Bruce Arians has to fix Jameis Winston, and he has to become the guy that's the undisputed leader of that football team. And I think on the defensive side, Devin White will be the cornerstone of that Buccaneer defense. He brings that Ray Lewis inspirational ability, high character kid, 4-4-2 speed. He's like Deion Jones, former LSU Tiger. What he's become with the Atlanta Falcons only probably a little bit better. This is a guy, a foundation piece, a guy that could be a guy who transforms that defense. And if Jameis develops, then it all comes together. If Jameis does it, then we're going to have struggles in Tampa continue. Yeah, I don't think there's any question that defensive coordinator Todd Bowles, Todd Bowles really does value his leadership ability. Yeah. Okay, because there's no question that their pass rush win rate for their rushers up front, other than JPP, they, didn't, they really didn't have it. So you could make a case for even Ed Oliver going down there, who's someone I know that they like, or Josh Allen going down there. But he needed that guy in the command and control center to kind of set the tone just right. like they do on offense. But I'm telling you what, the teams that now are sitting there going, look, there's some good defensive line yes. falling to us here. This is hey. crude. I mean, I, oh, created this. Hey. <laughs> which is interesting. So, just so people know, we've also made history with this pick. This is the first time in the common draft era, going back to 1967, that four of the first five picks are front seven players. We've never, it's Kyler Murray, and what do we think? A bunch of defensive guys, best, Bug. It's the best players in the draft. And also yep. with Tampa, let's not forget this. The Jerry McCoy saga has unfolded. Correct. He hasn't showed up yet. Okay, so what are they going to do? Maybe they come back later on and get an inside guy, but that saga is still to be untold. Still to be told. Speaking yeah. sagas, the Giants have been a saga yeah. this entire offseason. This is the first of their two picks in the first round. Uh, you see the back pages. Land of the loss. They let Landon Collins walk in free agency. They traded away Odell Beckham Jr. Dave Gettleman infamously said we didn't assign Odell to trade him. Yet and that's exactly what they did. Dave Gettleman has gone on to say since then we had a culture problem. <laughs> we don't have a culture problem anymore. Here's the problem they have. They haven't won a lot since their second Super Bowl appearance and win under Tom Coughlin in Super Bowl 46 when they took down the Patriots for the second time 21-17. They've made one playoff appearance in seven seasons. And oh, by the way, there is Dwayne Haskins. Been rumored for many, many months to possibly be going to the Giants. Mel, I think you had Haskins in your last yep. block, right? Yep. Going to the Giants. And what I did actually this morning, last night, I have a defense. I think defense is where they could go here. And I think when you look at Ed Oliver or you look at a Devin Bush, there's a linebacker, obviously, in, in the Josh Allen, a combo guy that they probably didn't expect to be here. Defense at six, but then get the quarterback at 17 if they pass on half. Again, yeah. they have six and 17, and Dave Gettleman has said he's not going to be forced into a pick. He's going to read the board the way he sees it. And what have we always said about Dave Gettleman? When he was the GM in Carolina, he used the term hog mollies yes. for the big guys. Yeah. He's always been a guy that likes the big guys up front. Will this pick at six be a quarterback, or will it be a hog molly for Dave Gettleman? We're about to find out. Giants fans are vocal. Let us go to Roger Goodell and find out what the Giants are doing at six. With the sixth pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the New York Giants select Daniel Jones, quarterback, Duke. Mel Kuyper Jr., you called it, you talked about it for the last couple of months, how much they love Daniel Jones out of Duke. And oh, by the way, just so you know, ESPN rated Daniel Jones as a zero-star recruit coming out of high school. Daniel, on behalf of us, our bad, we apologize. Daniel Jones is now the second quarterback off the board. He comes from an athletic family. His sister, Becca, plays field hockey at Davidson, a smaller school. 
in Carolina. Bates, his brother, also plays basketball at Davidson. His sister Ruthie also went to Duke, where she plays soccer. And now Daniel Jones with the connection through David Cutcliffe and his connection to the Manning family. This is Daniel Jones at the Manning Cast Passing Academy. Remember, Peyton Manning, David Cutcliffe was his offensive coordinator at Tennessee. Art, uh, excuse me, Eli Manning. He was, David Cutcliffe was his head coach at Old Miss. And one more time, this all seems to come to fruition as Daniel Jones now joins Eli Manning through the David Cutcliffe tree one way or another. Well, that's the thing, Trey. I thought, and I projected in the mock this morning, Daniel Jones of the Giants at 17. You say, okay, why did Dave Gettleman take him at six? Because they felt like, right, hey, we can't lose the guy we feel is a franchise quarterback. Lose him to the Redskins at 15, or the Bengals, or somebody trading up ahead of them at 17. So went and got him at six. Some will call it a reach. Bottom line is Daniel Jones has a chance to be a very successful starting quarterback. The cut clip factor certainly is a reason why what he's done in developing quarterback six went on in the NFL, led by Peyton and Eli. Daniel Jones' accuracy has been questioned. I watched him, and I saw the accuracy when he was pressured be pretty good, and he was pressured a lot. That offensive line couldn't protect him against top teams like Clemson. I think when you look at his mobility, he ran for 186 yards against North Carolina. He was a good basketball player in high school. I think you look at Daniel Jones in this system, in this offense for Dave Gettleman, they didn't want to wait, and you could say all you want. They felt like we identified our guy in Daniel Jones. Chris Mara left the owners' meeting to go to the pro day of Daniel Jones that showed they had a strong interest. Obviously, Eli, Peyton, Cutcliffe, and Daniel Jones all came together. But again, you pass on Dwayne Haskins, you pass on Drew Locke. They felt like Dave Gettleman did. I got my quarterback, and that's what he's going to be judged on, like John Dorsey with Baker Mayfield. Yep. Dave Gettleman, five, seven, ten years from now, he's going to be judged on this pick. And amazingly, this is not the first time the Giants have used a first-round pick on a Duke quarterback. In 1992, first round of the supplemental draft, they took Dave Brown out of Duke. But this year, it's all about Daniel Jones. Let's go down to Susie Culver, courtesy of DXL. Susie, the draft is unpredictable, and we just found that out. Well, it certainly is. But, Daniel, you told me that in your visit to the Giants, you really clicked with Pat Shermer. How so? Uh, I don't know. I just think he uh, he impressed me with his with his presence, who he was. And, and, you know, I'm looking forward to learning from him, the whole coaching staff, uh, you know, Coach Shula. And I'm just excited for the opportunity to be in New York. I'm, I'm thrilled. And, of course, your college coach, David Cutcliffe, also coached Eli. Tell us about some of those family ties. Yeah, I was fortunate to go to uh, go to Duke to play for Coach Cut, and, and you know him having the connection to uh, to Peyton and Eli, and, and uh, you know being able to get to know them and, and learn from them a little bit. So I'm certainly looking forward to, to learning from him in New York. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. Susie, Daniel, thanks very much. By the way, there's a different connection here. Uh, Jay Billis knew Daniel. His son grew up next to Daniel. He says when he came to a basketball camp at Duke once, his right hand was broken, so he had to use his left hand, and he said left-handed he was the best guy in the camp. So <laughs> the guy had some athletic ability. But, Lewis, did they make a mistake by passing on Dwayne Haskins? Well, I guess we'll see. Look, you know how I feel about believe? Dwayne Haskins. Well, look, you know how I feel about Dwayne Haskins. That would have been my guy, okay? That's a guy who I've been backing all along and a guy who I, continue to, I will continue to back. But look, Daniel Jones has some very redeeming qualities, okay? He is a good athlete. He is someone who can move around in the pocket. He is someone who can throw the ball short and intermediate in particular. He struggled, I thought, with his deep ball accuracy, whether leaving it short or overthrowing it with some clean pocket situations that were disappointing. He also had, you know, he was, quite honestly, he was, he was bit by his wide receivers not catching a lot of catchable passes as well. So there were some things that could have made his numbers look even better. But I'll just tell you this, just overall, from an overall pr prospect standpoint, I would have went with Dwayne Haskins, but we'll see here. Okay. Hopefully he turns out to be a fine quarterback for them. Mel, teams that may be looking at quarterback now, whether it's Denver or Cincinnati or Miami, how interested do you think they might be in about 20 seconds to going up and looking at, Drew, at uh, Haskins? Here? The key's the Redskins. I think the Redskins, yeah. Dwayne Haskins says, hey, I want to be there. They need him. They're at 15. Do they move up or they just hope he falls right in their lap? Yeah, Alex Smith still not recovered from that horrible uh, broken leg. So we'll see what happens with them. We know from our own Diana Rossini, they are really in on Dwayne Haskins. We're about to find that out. We'll get to Washington and those other quarterback needy teams in a bit. <laughs> but right now, the Jacksonville 
Jaguars are on the clock. Duval County is here, ladies and gentlemen. Duval! They know a thing or two about dealing with rain in Florida, so let's find out where they're going to go seventh overall. With the seventh pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Jacksonville Jaguars select Josh Allen, defensive end, Kentucky. Well, we had a mea culpa for Josh Allen, uh, for Daniel Jones when he was drafted. Dan, uh, Josh Allen was ranked as the 2,121st best prospect in his high school recruiting class. Let's just say he did a little better than that. He's now the seventh overall pick. Now, this is interesting. His uncle, Gregory Hines, was known as Duncan Hines when he played at Hampton University. His sister, Latori, was a forward at Towson. His other sister, Kyra, played at Cheney. She was a forward. And Maisha plays for the Washington Mystics from 2018 to now. And Josh went to a basketball school in Kentucky and set some records, including 17 sacks this season, Mel. This is the domino effect in the Raiders' move, taking well and Farrell at, at four, pushing Josh Allen down. You would have thought tight end T.J. Hawkins in Iowa, maybe Jawan Taylor, offensive tackle Florida. That would have been assuming Josh Allen was gone. But with Josh Allen there, Tom Coughlin stayed true to their board, just looked the best player, didn't force the need. Josh Allen went from seven sacks the last two years of 17 sacks this past season. Almost 6'5", 260 pounds, closes off the edge. When you look at what he was able to do with inside pressure, outside pressure this year, guys, he took his game from the good, the very good level to the elite level. Oh, he, he definitely can be elite, and I look forward to him getting better coaching. Right now, he's winning off pure athletic ability, and then when he gets better coaching, the ability not to take that extra step at the top of his pass rush, Jacksonville looking to put pressure on the quarterback. Look, when you combine Josh Allen with Yannick Ngakwe, Calais Campbell, yeah. Calais is 32 years old, they're looking down the road. Look, Taven Bryant has to come on. For Tom, I mean, for Tom Coughlin, but he's sitting there going, really? Josh yeah. Allen sitting right here? When I know that we are a defensive-centric, run-centric, class and pass type of team, and we need to produce turnovers again? Perfect for us. By the way, in the common draft era, Kentucky has watched just seven players come off the board in the first round. Four of those were top ten picks. The fifth is now Josh Allen, ready to roll. And boy, he's got to love the guys he's going to line up with on that defensive line in Jacksonville. All smiles for Josh Allen and his child with Roger Goodell. He's number one in Jacksonville. Welcome back to the 2019 NFL Draft, presented by Courtyard. Well, glad you're with us on a rainy night in Jacksonville. The crowd doesn't seem to care about that at all, and quite frankly, neither would they, because this is a hell of a lot of fun. We are up to the eighth pick in the first round, basically a quarter of a way through the first round. It is the Detroit Lions on the clock. The pick is in. Let's go to the commission. With the eighth pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select T.J. Hawkinson. Tight end, Iowa. Well, this is indeed significant because TJ Hawkinson now joins a very select group. He is just the fourth tight end chosen in the top 10 of the draft since 1997. And amazingly, another one was a Lions pick, Eric Ebron in 2014. His hometown of Cherokee, Iowa, they moved there from Cherokee. He finished third in a national softball throw. He's also a two-time All-State basketball forward in high school. But T.J. Hawkinson became the dude and one of two tight ends at Iowa that we might see go in the first round. And if you're saying to yourself, self, it sure seems like we hear a lot of these Iowa tight ends being drafted. You are correct. Since 2000, TJ now becomes the 10th tight end taken in the draft from the University of Iowa. They know how 
to deal with tight ends and create tight ends in Kirk Ferentz system at Iowa. They have done a great job. So tight ends being drafted is a tradition in Iowa. So is another tradition, the Iowa Children's Hospital. They wave to the fans and the players wave to them. It's one of the great scenes at Kinnick Stadium in all of college football. There you see the kids at the Iowa Children's Hospital. And the Iowa Children's Hospital now would like to return the favor. They have a little message for the latest Hawkeye to go off the board. From all of us here at the University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital, we want to say congrats to you, TJ Hawkinson, on being selected for the NFL Draft. We're so proud of you. So they're celebrating at the hospital, and you better believe they're having a good time at Iowa City at Donnelly's Pub. Mel, this is a guy that is a basketball player who became a great football player. He has a basketball background, nearly 6'5", 250. Talk about an athlete. Think about the Kirk Ferentz, Bill Belichick connection. You see him here on the hardwood getting it done for a tight end. We see it. Jimmy Graham and others translates very well. You see the blocking there and as well getting down to deal with that release, sealing the edge. He's a throwback to the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s can block it down the field, make the catch. But Quinn, Bob Quinn, the GM with Gronkowski, thinking about adding Jesse James. They brought him in via free agency. Now you bring in TJ Hawkinson, who is a multi-dimensional threat for Matthew Stafford now. You have Kenny Galladay. You have Marvin Jones. You have Tommy Lee Lewis. You got on Johnson at running back. You had Danny Amendola in the slot. Now you get a guy who will block and help out on Johnson and be a guy that Matthew Stafford knows clutch third down situations, red zone situations can go to Hawkinson and he will come down with the football. He really took over from Noah Fant. Noah Fant yeah. was supposed to be the guy. Nathan Stanley went to Hawkinson and he really stole the show the tight end away from Noah Fant. We'll have more on Noah Fant and he could go in the first round a little bit later. He mentioned Rob Gronkowski. Do you see those kind of similarities? No, I mean, that, that look, that, that's being ambitious. I mean, obviously Rob's one of the best to ever play it. But look, I, I will say this though. Philosophically, how they're trying to build a football team, it makes perfect sense. Well, they have a couple of high round draft picks on this offensive line. They have tried to address the big guys up front. Carry on Johnson, before he got hurt, was one of the bright young spots as far as running backs in the NFL. They have that taken care of. They need some more juice still at wide receiver, but they needed production out of the tight end position. Look, they only had 45 receptions out of the tight end position last year, which just isn't good enough. TJ's going to give you the run blocking, seal the edges. He's also one of those guys who is sneaky fast down the field who can rip off some big plays. You know, when you talk about philosophy, you have on Johnson. Now you can start to establish some physicality in the running game. Well, what happens? The safeties and the linebackers come up. You can work the middle of the field with play action pass. So this is a pick that goes with the philosophy of how you're building your team. Detroit wants to be physical. Okay, Trey Flowers up there in the philosophy. Now they want to play action and get the ball and give Matthew Stafford somebody to work the middle of the field with. By the way, he's the Mackey Award winner. Second Iowa tight end to do that. Dallas Clark yes, being the first. So congratulations uh, to uh, TJ Hawkinson going to the Lions. Meanwhile, one name that we haven't heard yet that we thought we might hear at this point is defensive end Montez Sweat out of Mississippi State. For more on why his name hasn't been called yet potentially, let's go to our insiders, Adam Schefter and Chris Mortensen. Guys? Well, Trey, there are a host of issues that have followed Montez Sweat, who is regarded as one of the top players in this draft and one of the reasons he has fallen to this point. There obviously are some teams concerned about a heart condition. He's off some boards, but some teams are not overly concerned. There are character concerns as well, dating back to his time at Michigan State, but teams regard him as an elite player but some say one GM said he could take a quote-unquote precipitous fall and he actually had a terrific senior bowl competition in the great combine and he ran not only those problems I spoke to his former Mississippi State coach defensive line coach Brian Baker who said that somebody will make a mistake by passing on this guy but he does have to get picked by the right team and what he told teams is you can't yell at this guy but Dre, we're back to you. Mort, Adam, thanks very much. He did run that 4-4-140 at the Combine. The pick is in for the Buffalo Bills. Let's see where they're going. With the ninth pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Buffalo Bills select Ed Oliver, defensive tackle, Houston. Ed Oliver. 
a man who is very confident in his abilities and the second horseman to go in the top 10 of this draft, much like Devin White of LSU, and has always been around horses. There's Caldonia. He also had a horse named Oreo. He said, that horse tried to kill me three or four times. <laughs> now, Ed has always been perceived as a little bit undersized to go inside where they played him at Houston. Played at about 275, 278. Is he concerned about that? Ed said, once you deal with a 1,000-pound animal, dealing with a 300-pound human ain't no thing at all. <laughs> this is one of your favorite players in the draft, uh, Lewis, as we see Ed Oliver going to the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, look, Sean McDermott, the head coach of the Buffalo Bills, must be sitting up there going, man, this just fell right to me. One, because I need somebody to replace Kyle Williams, who's one of the best pass rushing defensive tackles in the NFL. And two, my pass rushers who I have left on this football team are getting older. Jerry Hughes is going to be 31. Lorenzo Alexander is going to be 36. So when you look at Ed Oliver, who is the guy who you start to think he reminds you of a little bit? Man, Aaron Donald, if you're oh, watching the draft, you, went you know I love you and you're my guy. But let's just draw some comparisons here. Look, I said he was misused at Houston, but look at what he could do as a three technique. Here, if they're trying to reach him front side, he beats the block, gets a tackle for a loss. Look, those are the kind of things that the three technique. Now, when you watch Aaron Donald here, they're going to try and reach him. He just goes, no, you know what, I'll just come back to her, and I'll still get you for a tackle for a loss. Look, you know something about backdoor and people here's the three technique. You know what this is all about. Ed Oliver can do this if you put him in those situations. Hand use. Quick hand use, get into the offensive alignment, quick swim him, get into the backfield, create disruption. Look, Aaron Donald is the master. I'm not saying Ed Oliver is at that level. Huh. But I'm saying you can get saying. into huh. this level. You're kind These of saying. These are the kind of things that you want. And then we're talking about power. Just bull rushing somebody right back into the quarterback slap and just affecting the throw. Now, Aaron Donald had one of the best pass rushes you will see ever, where he said, you know what, maybe I can't get to the quarterback. I'll just take you, Weston Richburg, and throw you into the quarterback and take both of you down. So I'm saying this. He has potential. He has a lot of work to do. He was misused at Houston, but they needed this profile, and it's perfect for them. You know what I'll tell you? If you're watching Ed Oliver and the Houston tape, throw it away. I don't even count any of that tape. Yeah. When you yeah. put him in the National Football League, here's what I know. You need twitchy guys at the three technique. Think of Warren Sapp. 285, 290-pound guy. Think of John Randall, 285, 290-pound guy that can hit the B-gap. In this game, in today's game, you don't need 340-pound defensive tackles. It is the air raid. It is wide open offenses. You better have defensive tackles that can run and hit the B-gap. Trey, he has the highest ceiling yep. of any defensive no lineman in this draft. Now, he yep. also has the lowest floor right. because we don't know. We haven't seen him over the guard. So it's always a question transitioning someone from the center to the guard. But his ceiling is super high. He also has maybe the greatest attitude out there. When he was a freshman at his high school in Houston, uh, the starting tackle for the University of Texas was from his high school. He came back. Ed Oliver walked up to him and said, hi, I'm the guy that's going to make sure everybody forgets about who you are. <laughs> that's who Ed Oliver is. And he is having a good time right now. Ed Oliver going to the Buffalo Bills. So now we go to the 10th pick in the draft, and that is the Denver Broncos. And Vic Fangio is one of the oldest head coaches in recent memory in their first full season in the NFL. Longtime defensive coordinator has been great at that, but at the age of 61, he takes over the Broncos. And as you can see, some of those older coaches did not have great success. Since their win in Super Bowl 50, the Broncos have not had great success with quarterbacks. Hey, Trevor Simeon's above water. That's a huge win. Paxton Lynch is gone. One and three. These are all since Super Bowl 50. The Broctagon back there, 0 and 4. And Case Keenum, they shipped out. He's now in Washington. He was 6 and 10. So you take a look as you still see that crowd out there, which is fantastic. They picked up Joe Flacco. Well, since his Super Bowl 40. 6, 47 win, excuse me, over the San Francisco 49ers that got him that big contract. The numbers have not been there. And they did make the trade for Flacco, but do we think maybe Dwayne Haskins might be a direction they would go? This is an interesting one. It is I mean, could, very could, interesting. Could it be if you're really thinking long term? Sure, you could. Look, you have a new head coach in Vic Fangio. You have time, presumably, to kind of build your program. 
Is he necessarily what you need right now that will affect this football team this year? No. Are there other positions that they need? Yeah, they need to solidify offensive line in particular. They need more depth there. On the defensive side of the ball, look, in Vic Fangio's defense, last year they drafted a guy in Chicago named Robon Smith. Yes. Who was fantastic. There's a guy from Michigan. Devin Bush. Hold, hold Devin on, Bush. guys. There's hold a guy on, from Michigan who's sitting there. Hold on. We got some news here. We have a trade. Oh, boy. Our first trade of the night. Remember, there were five trades of first-round picks going into this right. night. Okay. This is the first one that's happened during the draft. Pittsburgh has traded up. Adam, oh. what more can you tell us about Pittsburgh trading up here? Well, Trey, this is the first time the Pittsburgh Steelers have traded up for a defensive player since 2001 when they went to get Troy Polamalu. They were on the phone with the Denver Broncos all day. The Broncos didn't want to give up this pick unless they were getting back a first-round pick and another third-round pick. That first could be Pittsburgh's next year first round pick and Denver had done a good long look on its quarterbacks and ultimately it believes in Joe Flacco and it's got a lot of needs that it needs to address right now Flacco is not one of them the quarterback is not one of them Pittsburgh was on the phone with the Broncos trying to get up and guess what other people wanted to move up for a defensive player here but the Pittsburgh Steelers get the deal done we'll see who they select soon enough but it's going to be costly Trey I promise you that all right Adam thanks we'll get the details of that trade in just a little bit so we know they have needs in certain places, but they have been consistent the last few years taking defense, uh, not since uh, David DeCastro on the offensive line, the guard out of Stanford, was the last offensive player they took in the first round, Lewis. Look, I'll tell you this, though. Look, Adam just said they traded up maybe to get a defensive player. What did they get hurt by this past year? Tight ends and running backs in the middle of the field in terms of pass coverage. Who's sitting there right yeah, now? There he is. The guy from Michigan named Devin Bush. It would make sense, wouldn't it? It we'll certainly see. would. All right, we believe the pick is in. Roger Goodell is going to tell, excuse me, in, in about 15 seconds, whether we think it might be Devin Bush, yeah. one of many defensive players out of Ann Arbor that might go in this draft. Yeah, look, I mean, there, there's some fine players. Look, Rashawn Gary's a fine player. You know, so, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of guys. Chase Winovich's a fine player. We'll see. All right, here we go. With the pick is in, let's find out where Pittsburgh is going with yet another first round pick looking like it's going to be a defensive play. The Denver Broncos have traded the 10th pick to the Pittsburgh Steelers. For Pittsburgh's pick, please welcome back to the stage 1979 Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year, Hall of Famer and Steeler legend Joe Green. With the 10th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Pittsburgh Steelers select Devin Bush, linebacker, Michigan. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not sure, and that is one heck of an outfit. Uh, I'm not sure. No, that is one heck of an outfit. <laughs> I love that outfit, Devin. Booker, that's that's got to be close to what you wore in your short sleeve suit. My oh, goodness. Why, why do we bring that up? Because uh, it was awesome. Uh, I, I just have to say this might be the first time we've had two Devins taken in the first 10 picks. Both inside linebackers, by the way. Devin White goes first to Tampa. And now Devin Bush, the linebacker, goes to the Pittsburgh Steelers in the trade. And, of course, there is a family history here. His father, Devin was, I believe, a 20th, 25th, 26th round pick uh, out of Florida State that went to the Atlanta Falcons. So Devin Bush now has bragging rights yeah. in the Devin Bush household of the Devin Bushes. And their relationship was not always great. At one point, Devin Bush was trying to toughen up his son. Devin Bush Jr. was eight years old and he fumbled in the red zone. And his dad said, you suck because of that. <laughs> and Devin Bush Jr. says, no, I don't. He said, yes, people that fumble suck. <laughs> the relationship has gotten better. Yeah. But right now, they are both first round draft picks in the NFL. Look, I played with Devin Bush Sr. I played with him in Atlanta. In you know the attitude. Absolutely. That guy is the thumper. Devin Bush Jr. is all of that. This kid is fast. He is a great blitzer. He has tremendous instincts. He will come downhill, and he will absolutely just test your will as an offensive lineman. He can tackle. I love this pick. I absolutely love it. I think he is pound for pound the best player in this draft, and I know people are going to say, you're crazy. Pound for pound, Devin Bush is the best player in this draft. He brings it. Pittsburgh Steelers, my hat's off to you. You traded up to get a guy that you, you could make that can make an impact for your football team. He's going to make an impact for your football team.
All right, let's go down to the interview now. It's Susie Culver standing by for this DXL moment with the second Devin Bush to go in the first round <laughs> Crazy. in the NFL draft. Wow. <laughs> man, there was a lot of emotion just walking down the hall. What, yeah. what were you feeling, thinking? Oh, uh, man, I just, it was just a whole bunch of emotions at one time. And, uh, you know, just the relief of the stress of the draft and knowing all the hard work I put in just to get here. And, you know, being that small percent that, that even gets a chance to get drafted, you know, everything just went through my mind. and. I just can't thank God enough and thank my family enough to support me through this process. Well, you know what? It has been a family affair. Your, yes. your dad was a first-round pick. He won a Super Bowl. Yeah. How did he shape this journey? Oh, man, <laughs> that guy right there, he's special. Uh, man, I don't, I don't know how he did it. I wish I knew, but he, I don't know how he did it. You know, there was a, a long-awaited hug after you won a high school championship, and then another hug tonight. Yeah. What's that moment like? Oh, man, this is so special. Uh, it's just hard to describe right now in words. But uh, man, I, I love I love my family. I love that guy especially, and um, I just can't wait to be a Steeler. Congratulations, the Steelers traded up to take right. you. Thank you. All right, there you see the hug, Susie. Thanks very much, and, and their their relationship is great now. Devin Bush Senior was on the Michigan staff, but show us what makes Devin Bush Junior so special. Look, I mean, there's this look running pass. There's nothing that the kid can't Yo, do. Look, all right, Devin, first, all right, look, yes. I, I played again. I played with Devin Bush when he was with the Atlanta Falcons. Not with the Rams, but I played with him when he was with the Atlanta Falcons. And I'll tell you this, the guy was super fast. He was absolutely one of the toughest players that you will ever see, and his son takes right after him. Look, this is one of the things that Devin does oh. the best, and that is timing up the snap count, making tackles for loss, really just attacking the line of scrimmage. They lined him up close to the line of scrimmage a lot, and he was a guy who just wrecked havoc. He has tremendous instincts. He has his eyes where they need to be pre-snap, and he is reading where he needs to, and then he knows where to go post-snap. You see that, that kind of closing speed on the second level, that's what the Steelers need as far as pass coverage is concerned against tight ends and running backs. And then this speed, that's just outright speed. He's gonna track you down on the outside. He's a low 4-4 guy. And when he comes there, he's coming with bad intentions. He is coming with bad intentions. Think about this. What, what are the Steelers missing since Ryan Chase got exactly hurt? Exactly right. What do they miss? Play They're missing a the playmaking linebacker that can run. Chase was a 4-3 guy. Yep. Bush is a 4-4 guy. Mike Tomlin, they get their guy in the middle. They can run sideline to sideline. 5-11, 234, all over the field. Durability. Will he be able to stay healthy at the pro level at that size? But he loves to play the game, and he will bring them a lot of leadership. Yep. He certainly will, and, and that, that presence that Ryan Shazier had, yes. you're, you're exactly right, yes. They've been trying to find that guy for a while. Bud Dupree, the linebacker out of Georgia a few years ago, they've been okay. Yep. They haven't been as impactful as Ryan Shazier was, and they're hoping it'll be Devin Bush now to fill those shoes. Cincinnati is now on the clock, and the pick is in. The Bengals, a lot of ways they could go at 11, with especially the way certain players may be falling. Let's go to Roger Goodell and find out what's going to happen. With the 11th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Cincinnati Bengals select Jonah Williams, tackle, Alabama. This won't be a pick that's going to elicit a lot of cheers from the stands and the crowds out here, but trust me, Jonah Williams is a football freak. This guy is unbelievable. 44 games in three seasons he started for Alabama. His, his attitude is incredible. This is a guy who made flow charts from every one of the guys that he was going to go up against every year. He takes this game seriously. They call him a football freak. They call him a football nerd. And all that has paid off now. By the way, he also enjoys doing a little cooking. Trey. You look at Jonah Williams and you think about a kid who has tremendous versatility. You look about a left tackle. People say, well, he's got short arms. He's going to have to move to right tackle, guard, or center. His arm length, longer arms than Andre Dillard, Washington State, where everybody looks at it as a pretty good left tackle prospect in this draft. I thought against Farrell in that playoff game, he held his own. He got overpowered once when he was off balance. Other than that, he did a really good job. You move him over to the right side or inside the guard, he can be pro bowl. I think he's got a shot to be a left tackle as well. Jonah Williams comes to play every week. He's durable and he understands how to keep that frame between the defensive end and his quarterback booker. I think from a standpoint of a guy who's plug and play, he's as good as anybody in this draft. I'm glad Cincinnati made this pick. You know, leading up to the draft, we kept hearing about Mitch, his arm length, height, weight. I don't care. Put the tape on. Jonah Williams has blocked at the University of Alabama in the SEC. 
for the last several years. He understands yeah. how to block. I don't care about his arm length. The guy knows how to pass block. By the way, he wears 73 because he loves Joe Thomas. They met each other at the Combine. Joe Thomas signed a jersey that says 173 to another. Drink beer, eat food, be happy. We love you, Joe. <laughs> the draft continues from Nashville. This is the 2019 NFL Draft, presented by Courtyard. Step into the biggest stage of their lives. In the land of music, you ain't heard nothing yet. Draft rolls on now as the Green Bay Packers are on the clock. Time to take a look at Mel's best available, brought to you by Courtyard. Mel. Wayne Haskins, he's still available here, middle of the first round. The Redskins sit there at 15. Will he fall right in their lap? Christian Wilkins right there. We thought top 10, possibly. Montez Sweat with the heart situation. Does he drop a little bit? And then Jeffrey Simmons, the ACL, the off the field issue. And then Lindstrom, another plug and play guy like Jonah Williams from Alabama. All right, here comes the first of the two Green Bay Packers picks. Again, they got the other one in the trade with the New Orleans Saints. The first in the Matt LaFleur era. Let's see where they go. With the 12th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select Rashawn Gary, linebacker, Michigan. So Rashawn Gary goes off the board 12th overall, second Michigan defensive player we've seen in the last three picks. What's interesting here is that Rashawn Gary, when he went to Michigan, was the number one recruit in the country. And he blew people away again at the combine with the numbers he put up in terms of weightlifting and the 40 time and all that kind of stuff. But the knock on him at Michigan was the athletic ability and the stats never really matched up. And here's the issue. The guy on the other side, Chase Winovich, made more plays and played better. When you're a guy who was the number one recruit, and you have the type of athletic ability that Rashawn Gary has, you expect more. I mean, Trey, he's a physical specimen. Correct. You want him coming off the plane first. He's the all-airplane team, but the production and the athletic ability doesn't match. I feel like when he gets to the next level, he's a guy that's going to need a lot of coaching, not only with technique, but how you play. How can you use that athletic ability and turn it into playmaking? It's one thing to be a great athlete, but can you be a playmaker? Because this is a guy that lacks production, Lewis. Yeah, look, a lot of times when you turn on their film, and especially as you start watching it as the season goes on, on third downs, when there was obviously third and five, third and six plus, he wasn't even on the football field. And you start it's tough to ask yourself, what is going on here? Because when you watch Chase Winovich rush the passer, when you talk about getting coaching, I mean, Chase has some of the most advanced hand usage yeah. as far as rushing the passer yeah. as anybody in this draft. I'd stack him right up there against Nick Bosa. Yeah. So you're going, what was it connecting with Rashawn, Mo? Well, I think when you look at those computer numbers that you talked to about Boogan Lewis, 6'4 and a half, 277 pounds. The long arms ran 4'5'8 the combine, 26 reps, incredible upper body strength, and a 38 vertical. Those are number one pick yeah. overall numbers. Right. Yeah. He was number one coming out of high school. He didn't translate that into production, sack production. He had 10 sacks in 34 football games. That's not going to get it done. He was the most polarizing player in this draft. He was kind of an enigma, an underachiever. Hey, if the light goes on and you can coach him up, a D-line can get the most out of him, yeah. he could be really good. He's always had everything you want in a player. Right. You're just having to get out everything yeah. you want from that player with those athletic abilities. All right, we'll see what happens. Meanwhile, up next will be the Miami Dolphins. Where will they go under their new head coach, Brian Flores? Hello, Nashville. Are you having as much fun as we are? The pick is in. The Miami Dolphins pick is in. Oh, thank you, Darius and Jason Fitz, as we continue with the 13th pick now. The Miami Dolphins are on the clock. They, of course, have their new head coach, Brian Flores, who came over from the Super Bowl champion Patriots, and the pick is in. Let's go to Roger Goodell. With the 13th pick 
in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Miami Dolphins select Christian Wilkins, defensive tackle, Clemson. So that is the second of the potential three defensive linemen from Clemson that will go off the board. And there is a look of exasperation and relief from Christian Wilkins. Christian Wilkins, of course, wears number 42 for his grandfather, Yuri A. Stamps, who was shot when police raided his house and a rifle discharged accidentally. They were not there for Yuri. They believed a stepson was dealing drugs. The gun went off accidentally, and Christian Wilkins during his time at Clemson, by the way, he stayed for four years, wore number 42 to honor his late grandfather. And Christian Wilkins was the one that really put that band of merry men together as he gives the jump and the chest bump to Roger Goodell. Roger, no offense, you're feeling that tomorrow. Because that is a big dude right there. He was the one that put the entire group together, called them the Power Rangers. Booger, all those five defensive linemen. Wilkins might be the best of the bunch. I don't think there's any might to it. I think he is the best defensive lineman that was on that Clemson team. A big athlete. And you talk about athleticism. You can right. measure with height, weight, speed. You can do a lot of different. But this young man can do something crazy that I don't think me, you, know oh. can do. Look at that. Oh. Do it, big fella. Do it. <laughs> that was after the first national championship game as a freshman. But what he can do when he's not splitting is splitting double teams. He has lateral movement. He has power. He has speed. He can make plays from tackle to tackle the way no one in this draft at this size can at over 300 pounds. He has scheme versatility. He can play in a 3-4 or a 4-3, whether that's nose guard, defensive tackle, or 4-I. I love this pick for Miami. Head coach Brian Flores is showing up up front. Very similar to the way they did in New England. They're doing the same thing now in Miami. Washington Redskins are one pick away from maybe getting Dwayne Haskins without having to move. Incredible. Teams like Cincinnati, Miami, you would have thought would have been spots maybe perhaps in particularly Miami. It tells you the league, for whatever reason, Lou, did not have the high opinion of Haskins that we did. Now, that could be proven wrong by the Washington Redskins, sure. but there were opportunities here to take Dwayne Haskins, and teams have consistently passed on him all the way up until this point. Absolutely. You know, but you know what? I'll tell you this. We'll just keep it about Christian Wilkins for this in this in this instance, and I agree with you, Mel. I agree with you here, and I think teams are going to regret, regret the fact that they keep passing on Dwayne Haskins. But look, Christian Wilkins, I think is fantastic. He's one of those people who I thought was under-talked about in the pre-draft buildup. When Booker talks about scheme versatility, look, who's going to have more scheme versatility than Brian Flores? And who's going to require your players to be very smart, like Christian yes. Wilkins, who's yes. one of the smartest players in this draft? It's to, a perfect match. To that point, he took home the William Campbell Trophy, which is the academic Heisman. He graduated in two and a half years. He is smart. He is big. And he just laid a lick on the commissioner. Yeah, so for did. more on all of that, let's go down to Susie Culver for this DXL moment with the big man, Christian Wilkins. Christian, leading up to the draft, you said you couldn't imagine what it was going to be like when that phone rang. So what was it like? I mean, it's everything I imagined. I just can't wait to be a part of this league and, and be an ambassador for this league. This, this game so special. I love it so much. And it deserves to be played the right way. And I'm going to do that in the league. And the Dolphins going to get everything out of me. You know, people talk about your uncommon maturity and your perspective on life. What shaped you? Hey, just my just my grandfather, man. He he was the biggest influence in my life. I was so glad I had him in my life for 14 years. And so each and every day when I go on that field, I make sure I honor him every day and everything that I do. It's beautiful. Let's have a little fun. That D-line, that D-line, it's really emotional moment. What are you feeling right now, Christian? Man, it's just feeling great, man. I'm just ready to tear this league up become a part of something bigger than myself and, and just be accountable for everything and just, and just make the Dolphins a better organization. All right, let's get a smile. That D-line of Clemson, right? The That's Power right. Rangers. More let's to come. See. That's right. More to come. Clemson all day. Let's see it. Show the camera. Let's Draw see that line. That's yeah. That's right. Represent. Congrats. Well, as we said, it is morphin' time because the Clemson Power Rangers, they all dress up for Halloween. There's three of them that are going to go in the first round. Two are likely to go after that, including Austin Bryant and Albert Huggins. The Power Rangers are powered up. They had so much fun doing that. 
at Clemson. Meanwhile, the pick is in for the Atlanta Falcons at 14. They were so banged up defensively a year ago. Let's find out where the Eagles go, excuse me, the Falcons go right now. With the 14th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons select Chris Lindstrom, guard, Boston College. One of many Boston College players that will be drafted this year. Chris Lindstrom is a guy who was very durable, played for his father when he was in high school. Oh, by the way, his brother Alec also plays center at Boston College, and he continues that long line of Boston College offensive lineup. There's his dad, Chris, an NFL defensive end from 1983 to 1987, with, among other teams, the Kansas City Chiefs. His uncle was also a D-end at Boston College. And then, of course, his brother that he lined up against from the area wants to continue that legacy. He says Boston College is OLU, and That's he wanted right. to bring that back, and he was a very reliable starter, Mel, all the way along from yeah, Boston College. Yeah, you think College. about a kid ran 491. I think with the athletic Big. ability he showed when you look at the tape and you see a four-year starter at Boston College, guys. He played a little tackle, but here's a guy I think when you look at as a pure guard coming in at 6'3", nearly 330 pounds. He's a finisher. This kid plays with a mean streak, plays with a defensive mentality. You saw it there. You saw it down in Mobile, the senior bowl practices. He's the kind of guy like Jonah Williams who you put into that starting lineup and you forget about for 10 or 12 years, folks. I think really simple, we can say this. He's the best guard in the draft. That's what the Falcons just got right now. They got the best guard in the draft. And the way Dan Quinn wants to play, be physical, be able to run the football and be solidified in the middle, they got the best guard, I think, in the draft. Look, look, I remember going down to Atlanta and watching them against the New York Giants in Monday Night Football and seeing Matt Ryan just under siege. Yeah. Okay? Sacked yeah. 42 times last year, 24 in 2017. There's a problem there along the offensive line. They oh draft Chris, Chris, Chris Lindstrom <laughs> to help shore that up. By the way, Christian Wilkes, Christian Lindstrom, as you see the reaction there, and listen to it. First BC player to go in the top 15 since Luke Keekley went ninth overall in 2012. That worked out well for the Panthers. See if this one works out well for the Falcons. Stay with us. Work good year, more driven. About halfway through the first round, Mel. Time to take a look at your best available brought to us by Courtney. Yeah, there's a highly rated quarterback, Dwayne Haskins, still there. Maybe the Washington Redskins to get their quarterback for now and the future. Montez Sweat, an elite pass rusher, potentially with the medical situation that's pushing him down. Jeffrey Simmons at ACL, pushing him down as well as the off the field issue. And there's the number one running back, maybe in line to be an Oakland Raider. We'll see Josh Jacobs from Alabama. Let's not try and predict with the Raiders. Never. <laughs> let's, let's definitively not do that. We'll deal with the Raiders again when we get yes, into the 20s. Will. Right now, we're focused in on Washington. Our intrepid NFL reporter, Diana Rossini, has reported the last couple of days they really like this kid, Dwayne Haskins. There's a lot of things that would make sense if that would be the case. Let's find out right now if it works out that way. With the 15th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Washington Redskins select Dwayne Haskins, quarterback, Ohio State. Well, Washington fans seem happy, and here's why. He was born in Highland Park, New Jersey, but moved to Potomac, Maryland before high school. He attended an Ohio State football camp at the age of 11 and said he wanted to come back and play quarterback, which he did. He's scheduled to graduate this May in broadcasting, wants to be a journalist. And there is the reaction from the Baltimore Bowling Alley in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Dwayne Haskins realizing he is going to be a Washington Redskin. And why is this significant? Well, Dan Snyder's son goes to the same school where Dwayne Haskins played, the Bullis School of Potomac, Maryland. And oh, by the way, it is just a hop, skip, and a jump from FedEx Field 
some 27 miles away as Dwayne Haskins put on a show in high school. And if you don't believe me, if you're a visual learner, look at it this way. It's not Calvert Hall, Mel, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's close enough. There it is from Potomac, Maryland and the Bullis School to the Redskins practice facility in Ashburn. It is 28 miles away. Lewis, this is your guy. Huh. 50 touchdowns against only eight picks last year. Yeah, look, and this is a guy who tore it up against ranked opponents as well. He can do it all. Look, he has movement in the pocket. He has accuracy, short, intermediate, and deep. He knows when to put gas on it. He knows when to take some of it off and throw the football with touch. And look, you can't penalize him for going against, or rather having weapons at his disposal like he had this best year. You can't penalize him for having an a offensive coordinator like Ryan Day, who's now the head coach. You can't penalize him for those kinds of things because he took advantage of everything that was given to him, everything that he earned. He's just a guy who I think right now is going into a situation as far as the quarterback room is concerned that is perfect for him. He has Case Keenum there. Alex Smith will be around. He has two people who he can learn from, who they can be patient with him. They need to, they need to get him some weapons, make sure the running game is straight. This offensive line of Washington, when it is healthy, is one of the best in the NFL. Look, as far as Washington is concerned, Dan Snyder, the owner, Jay Gruden, the head coach, I think they made a slam dunk pick. Well, you can see the movement there, right? Look, oh, he's not. Look, the, immo the immobility argument here is just ridiculous. Correct. And it's not true. You know, usually when you have the number one pick, you get the best quarterback in the draft if you need one. Washington is down here at 15. There have been two quarterbacks selected before Dwayne Haskins, and they got the best quarterback in this draft right now. You have to feel really good for Doug yeah. Williams, Bruce Allen, and Jay Gruden in Washington. NFC East is going to be fun. Yeah. Uh, got the Giants, who took Daniel Jones, yeah. and now the Redskins with Dwayne Haskins. You got Dak Prescott, and you got Carson Wentz. And you can bet, this kid's got quiet confidence. I sat with him at the combine. Absolutely. We did. Absolutely. He we all come did. come in with a chip. Is yeah. he saying, okay, you passed? Now I'm in the same division. Oh, are you kidding yeah, me? That's yes. going to be very entertaining <laughs> are to watch. You kidding? That, that will not be something that he forgets. All right, for more on this, and, and we talked about it earlier, our, our NFL reporter Diana Racine yeah. was all in on this, talking about the Washington's interest in, in Dwayne Haskins. For more on this, let's bring in Diana. Diana, great job. What can you tell us? Yeah, Troy, this, there was definitely a split inside the Redskins organization. You had some on the football side of this building that wanted to address other positions, and the quarterback position was not on that list. And then you had those in the front office, team president Bruce Allen, and of course, Daniel Snyder, the owner, who have been locked in on Dwayne Haskins. I was actually told that Daniel Snyder attended one interview during the Combine, and that was in Haskins. That was with Haskins. And tonight, Trey, he got his guy. He certainly did. Listen, he's done this before. He made sure they went up and got RG3, yeah. uh, and he's doing this now. By the way, just so people understand the season that Dwayne Haskins put on there, 50 touchdowns, one of only six FBS quarterbacks to ever throw that many touchdowns. The old record for Big Ten touchdowns was 39 by Drew Brees. He had 50. Passing yards, 4,831. The old record was 3,900. Total offense, over 49. The old record was 4,272 by Denard Robinson. Look, and we he talk, blew it out of the water. When we, when we talk about context, when we talk about stats, and it gets quality competition, it gets ranked opponents, six ranked opponents, 20 touchdowns, two interceptions. Yep. It's the third most number of touchdowns in the past 15 years yeah. against no, ranked opponents. Ohio State played Michigan, where Andy, that's their rival, right. right? Then they played Northwestern Big Ten Championship game, then Washington and Rose Bowl. Three games, 14 touchdowns, one pick. He did great, and now he's a member of the Washington Redskins, and we have, believe it or not, guys, come to the halfway point <laughs> of the first round of the draft. Already? Hey, listen, this just for you, Booger. <laughs> Carolina Panthers are on the clock. Let's see where they go. Here's Commissioner Roger Goodell. With the 16th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Carolina Panthers select Brian Burns, defensive end, Florida State. Well, if you want a guy that has bend off the edge, Brian Burns is your guy. Since the end of the season, he knew a lot of people thought he might have been a little too light in the seat, for lack of a better term. Went on a 5,000-calorie-a-day diet, gained almost 20 pounds, and when he went to the combine, by the way, did not lose a single tenth of speed in his 40 time. He bulked up and was still just as fast. 
Weight gain, not a surprise, because he was only about 210 pounds coming out of high school. He's a Marvel Comics freak. By the way, Endgame out tonight, but the draft is better. Uh, does the Spider-Man thing. Speaking of Marvel, let's take a look at some of the things that Brian Burns. Like, yeah, there you go. Brian Burns leading the charge. 10 sacks, 15 and a half tackles for losses, Mel, this year at Boston yeah, College. 23 career sacks, Trey. You look at you talk about Ben, you talk about Blaine. the Sox. Close in speed, obviously he's got some style, Boog. Well, without a doubt. Oh, oh. I, I love the fact that we're just going to skip over the main part. He went on a 5,000 calorie diet. How many of us would love to do that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> 5,000 calories. Without a doubt. But, but, but when you look at this guy, you hear the word twitch, Ben, speed, athlete. Is there a concern about the weight? Can he keep it on? I'm sure there is, but that'll come with maturity. Carolina needed an edge rusher. They needed somebody that can turn the corner to go along with K1 Short. When you have the front four that can get after the quarterback, especially in the NFC South, now you can go against guys like Jameis Winston and Matt Ryan. I love this pick for Carolina. Burns is a traditional pass rusher, especially if he can keep the weight up. Yeah, speaking about front four, look. The Carolina Panthers had the fourth highest blitz percentage in the NFL last year. How come? Because with four, they couldn't rush the passer. And look, hey, I credit that to our stats and research department. That's the best. They're the best in the world. They gave me that stat. I'm just reading it to you. This, this makes sense for them, okay? They need juice off the edge. They got it with Brian Burke. Listen, absolutely. And he's been productive every year at Boston College, and now they hope him to be productive in Carolina. Hey guys, it's round two for the New York Giants at 17 when we come back. Hey, how you guys holding up out there? The 2019 NFL Draft presented by Courtyard is brought to you by GMC. Live like a pro. Gemini Man, in theaters everywhere October 11th. And Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Welcome back to the 2019 NFL Draft, presented by Courtyard. Well, the draft continues as we are on to pick 17 in the first round, and that is, of course, the second of two picks that the New York Football Giants have. And you may be saying to yourself, wait a minute, how did they get that pick? Oh, yeah, they traded away Odell Beckham Jr. and Olivier Vernon, getting back this pick and also getting uh, Jabril Peppers and Kevin Zeitler, plus a 2019 third-round pick, which we will see tomorrow night. 90 fifth overall in downtown Nashville. So that's why the Giants are in the position they're in. They went Daniel Jones. Mel, tip of the cap to you, man. You were on the Daniel Jones things before anybody. It's like you're good at your job. <laughs> that guy is really good at cheering on the Giants. That much we know. So where will the Giants go with the second pick here? All kinds of possibilities for them. We know Dave Gettleman, the GM, likes them Hog Molly's books. Well, and this is the draft where the value is on the offense and defensive line. And so if you're looking for a safe pick, especially after they got their quarterback, Daniel Jones, I would look for them to get somebody inside that can push the pocket, somebody that can eat up some space, Trey. Yeah. The Hog Molly's take up some space inside. It is interesting, though, right? Dave Gettleman said, I'm not going to reach for a pick. A lot of people thought he might have reached for the quarterback oh, he did. at six. <laughs> so we'll see if he – I know Mel doesn't think he did, but we'll see if I it goes. Kite, kite, kite. No <laughs> such thing as a reach for a quarterback once you identify him as your guy. Listen, hey. if it works out, it doesn't matter. Exactly. Hey, if it Don, works out, it doesn't matter. Hey, Don nothing. Maris said this. As long yeah. as the value matches up, he doesn't care. No. All right. Well, he be it better match up. <laughs> let's see what the Giants do here now at 17. Joining us from Camp Humphreys in South Korea, please join me in welcoming members of the 2nd Infantry Division, Division ROC U.S. Combined Division. Among them is Warrant Officer James Benecki. He's a native of Brooklyn, New York, and he's about to make the Giants pick. Officer Benecki, take it away. With the 17th pick, of the 2019 NFL Draft, the New York Giants select Dexter Lawrence, defensive tackle, Clemson. Second and nine! Yeah! Yeah! And, and 
with that pick, ladies and gentlemen, Dexter makes three. Joining North Carolina State in 2006 as the only time we've had one school deliver three first rounders from the defensive line. That year was Mario Williams number one overall, Manny Lawson, and John McCargo. This year, it is Cleland Furl, Oakland, and then Christian Wilkins out of Miami, and now Dexter Lawrence, who, by the way, was a 360-pound freshman recruit. He says he models his game after Indomitian Sioux. He modeled his recruiting eating after Christian Wilkins. Wilkins told him, look, when they take you out to dinner, eat like three steaks. <laughs> you might have had four, Boog. You know, we, we've heard the term dancing bear. Yeah. This is a dancing grizzly bear. A man that's 340 pounds, that's this size, and has this movement, and he ran five flat in the 40. What you're going to get with him is a guy that can take on blockers. He's a run stopper. He, he's throwing it back to the olden days. Not a pass rush. Yes, he can push the pocket. But the ability to lock it down from tackle to tackle is what you're getting from Dexter Lawrence. I'll tell you what, look at him, but when he was healthy, that's the key. And he could stay healthy. As a freshman, he set that sack record with seven. Then he only had three and a half the next two years combined because he was banged up. Then he had that great game in the ACC championship game against Pitt. Stay healthy, he was a sack guy, but he wasn't. He was contained. You don't draft a defensive tackle in the first round in 2019 unless you think he can get after the quarterback. I think what Dave Gettleman did said, hey, as a freshman, when he was 100%, he showed he could do that, Lewis. Yeah, you know what's interesting about this pick right here? This really, right now, this makes me think of Montez Sweat. This is where the New York Giants could use that profile. Yeah, the okay. defensive end right. out of yeah. Mississippi State. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The defensive end from Mississippi State. Why? Think of James Bender's scheme. It's kind of a hybrid 3-4. They have one real pass rusher on the edge in Lorenzo Carter, who's not a dominant pass rusher. They need speed off the edge. They were 30th in sack rate last year. They were 30th in number of sacks last year, that being the New York Giants defense. Montez Sweat makes sense. But why is he falling? We know what the issues are. This is That's why the profile, look, I, I'm not arguing with the position, but the profile, it seems like Sweat would be the better fit. And there you see the three again, joining North Carolina State in 2006. And that third one, Dexter Lawrence, was suspended this year from the college football playoff by testing positive for Osterine. He says he doesn't know how it got into the system. Um, do you think that'll be anything going forward with him in, in the NFL? I would, I would hope not. Yeah. You know what? And, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping that if that was just a mistake on, on somebody's part or an oversight on somebody's part, and it's something that doesn't follow him for the rest of his career. Because, look, you're right. This is a big, big man yes, yes. with unique athletic ability who can really cause some damage and do some damage. You can't go wrong with these kind of guys. I'm just saying this, this, this really now that he's been picked, Where's Montez Sweat going to go? Because it made sense for this defense, that profile, that speed, that length on the edge. Man, it makes it very. It makes me very curious as to where, where does this fall stop for him. Yeah. Well, listen, we'll find out. Uh, right now, it is Minnesota on the clock. Minnesota, of course, was all in on Kirk Cousins, the $84 million contract in the offseason last year. They thought they were one player away. The hard lesson for Minnesota is that no team is ever one player right. away. You can't expect everything to replicate itself from year to year. Everything broke right for them in 2017. A lot of things broke wrong for them in 2018. And at this point, you wonder where they go on their board because there's a lot of ways to go depending on how they feel the board is shaking up for them. Yeah, you know what? Offensive line would make sense for this football team to really to continue to, to solidify it so they can run the ball for a better average for carry clip. We'll see. All right, let's find out. The pick is in. Let's go to Commissioner Goodell. With the 18th pick, in the 2019 draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Garrett Bradbury, yes! center, North Carolina State. I can promise you there are a lot of teams picking in the 20s that are upset that Garrett Bradbury is now off the board. So Viking fans, skull yourselves, skull all the way. This kid is interesting. He graduated in three and a half years with a 3.7 GPA in supply chain information systems. There is Garrett Bradbury. Oh, by the way, he also could have been a very, very good baseball player. In fact, 
He once told me, if you thought me I was going to play center, I would ask you, where am I playing college baseball? Because that's what I really wanted to do. Garrett Badbury could have been a very, very good baseball player. Was a catcher as well as first base at Charlotte Christian High School in North Carolina. And he said one of the things he loves about playing center is the exact same thing he loved about being a catcher. I get my hands on the ball, Mel, on every play. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you think about an athlete, and that's what Brad Berry is. He's a good technician, he's a smart football player, great character, Ryan Finley, the quarterback. You have him as your anchor, you know you can do some damage. You look at a guy like Brad Berry, nice blocks on the move. I love his awareness. Overpowered, you would think, in the NFL is going to be the concern by those huge, massive defensive tackles, but it's not a major issue. I'm sure the Rams, as you guys said, and other some teams late in the first round, a little disappointed he was gone, but he's the kind of guy for the Vikings. That offensive line was a mess, and Bradbury's got to be a key guy and anchor that group and improve that group moving forward. As far as the center, he was the best reach blocker in this draft, the guy that can come out and reach the nose guard. And when you understand what Zimmer wants to do, Mike Zimmer, and you understand the philosophy they want to employ in Minnesota. They want to run the football. They want to get Dalvin Cook one cut and coming downhill. Well, if you want to do that, what must you have? You better have a center that can reach a nose guard and get to the second level. A big athlete that can move in space is what you have in this center. Well, listen, one thing to be curious about and keep note, a lot of people talked about the ACC having a down year and Clemson really had a a, a coast to the national championship in the semifinals. Five of the last six picks in this draft have been ACC players. Boston College and now North Carolina State along with Clemson. Sure, look, there, there's good players. There's good players all over the country. And you know what, you can never, look, although it, it gets cyclical and maybe you know, different conferences have more players drafted from year to year. But the ACC is here, and they're here to stay. And Clemson, in particular, is here to stay. Right. And Garrett Bradbury is here to stay, especially in the NFC North. Because I'll tell you this, let me just add this comment. You want to make your quarterback better, run the ball better. How are you going to run the ball better mm. if it's a mm. offensive line? Yes. They have the weapons on the perimeter. Garrett Bradbury is one of those guys who, when you watch him against good competition in the ACC, when you watch him against Clemson's defensive line, he was getting after Christian. Yep. He was getting after Dexter. These, this is a good football player. This is a smart pick for them. Listen, something to keep along is, by the way, the Tennessee Titans, the home team, are now on the clock. We've had some incredible moments in the last couple of <laughs> outdoor drafts with some of these uh, home team picks. Keep this in mind. We're into the second half of the first round. We have yet to have a wide receiver or running back taken. The last time we didn't have a wide receiver taken in the first round was 2008. And it's only happened one other time since then, 1990, I believe, was the other time. So only twice in the common draft era have we not had a wide receiver taken in the first round. And there are still a lot of defensive linemen and offensive linemen to come off the board. We knew this draft was going to be dominated by the guys up front. After Kyler Murray left, we've seen where the value is in this draft. The value. If you're a smart GM and you want to look smart on Monday, right. continue drafting guys that can affect the quarterback and block the guys that affect the quarterback. That's where your team is built right now, and you're seeing it play out right in front of our eyes. Okay, so we believe John Robinson's a pretty smart gentleman for the Tennessee Titans. This is a guy who knows how to build a team. There, there are big questions Questions for both him and the Tampa Bay Bucks at quarterback Marcus Mariota and Jameis Winston. In the final, basically, 56, yeah, final year of their deal. <laughs> Had to do the quick math, count it up with the fifth year option. Where do we see Lewis the, the biggest need being for Tennessee? You know, could, could quarterback be one of those teams that uh, one of those positions that's in play right now? You think? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I mean, we just don't know how right, to really feel right, about right. Marcus Mariota. This is really what, where did, how did, how is their board stacked right now? Who is sticking out to them on a football team that maybe could they use another wide receiver? Could they continue to want to build out the offensive line? Could they use more, more help along the defensive line? There's so many different ways you can go here because with Tennessee, it's really about at this point in time, sitting here at this pick, and the best player available. It really is. Here's what I know. Derek Morgan and Brian Arakpo haven't affected the quarterback in a while. Okay, right. we know Jarrell Casey inside. He is a beat. So are you going to get somebody that's going to affect the quarterback, whether inside or outside, in Dean P's scheme? To me, I think that's what they lean. I'll call it juice on both sides. Yes. So they, yes. they don't have yes. that, that impact before. Yes. Corey Davis yes. hadn't been that guy at wide yeah. receiver. They need the pass rusher. You're right. I mean, they, yeah. got, they got right now, they kind of plateaued a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Arakpo actually retired, so he's out of there. Mike Frabel, of course, 
uh, came over from New England, as did John Robinson. We'll see if that New England influence is in there about how they go about their business. But the Tennessee fans are fired up. This is their time to shine. They are waiting to find out who will be the next member of the Tennessee Titans. There are a lot of ways for this team to go. The pick is in though and as you can see by the way the weather seems to have cleared and again it seems to have not bothered anybody. Nobody ever left. Here's Commissioner Roger Goodell walking to the podium to find out where the home team Tennessee Titans will go with this pick. To join me for the Titans pick are 13 high school football captains from teams across Nashville. These teams represent Metro Nashville public and private schools in Davidson County. They also exemplify commitment to team and community. Please welcome your local high school student athletes. With the 19th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Tennessee Titans select Jeffrey Simmons, defensive tackle, Mississippi State. Okay. We need to have a discussion about Jeffrey Simmons, and some of it will be uncomfortable, but I think we need to explain what is going on here. Jeffrey Simmons was one of the most highly recruited players coming out of high school going to Mississippi State. And then he was involved in an incident which can only be described as for lack of a better term disturbing. In March of 2016 he was involved with a physical altercation in Macon Mississippi involving a 30 year old woman his mother and his sister. He was found guilty of malicious mischief pled no contest three women involved in the altercation were also charged and he was enrolled in Mississippi State and was suspended for one game. Now there is video of this incident and we're going to share it with you because it's important to explain why Jeffrey Simmons is being selected where he is. We should tell you it is a little disturbing but this was an altercation involving his sister another woman and his mother on another level and Jeffrey Simmons then entered that altercation. The initial video which we are about to show you now shows Jeffrey Simmons sister in a fight with that other woman and then Jeffrey Simmons entered and initially when he entered what he did was he separated his sister from the woman that she was fighting with and then unfortunately it did not stop there. Jeffrey said his emotions got the best of him and as you see after he separates his sister from the fight he then lands several blows on the woman on the ground and we need to explain in context what happened here and Jeffrey Simmons says everybody's seen the video everybody knows what happens it's pretty much the same thing I've been doing since it happened I've been honest about the situation just laid it on the line to teams to anyone who asked me there's nothing to hide it's a mistake I made back in high school I regret it to this day I grew from it. And it's important to explain that there had been a very, very long history of really awful stuff that had gone on between the woman in that fight, Jeffrey Simmons' sister, and his mother as well. No one is excusing the action, much in the same way no one excused the action from Joe Mixon, the running back in Oklahoma. But it is important to point out that the circumstances around that action are very, very different. And for more on that, we bring in Adam Schefter and Chris Mortensen. Trey, in talking to teams inside the, around the league, the football people in the league pretty much felt like all the information they gathered from that incident and what they believe is not an incident, the assault, uh, and the information they got from the coaching staff and other people at Mississippi State is that he was somebody who truly had redeemed himself at the highest level under these awful circumstances. And the other par part of this is certainly is that owners, however, I would say about 11 that, uh, that I counted, had Simmons taken off their boards no matter what the glowing reports yeah. were in terms of how contrite he was and what he did to correct those matters. He was off many boards, but he also was on some boards because multiple teams 
had checked into his background and felt comfortable with what they learned about his character since that incident. There were teams that called him a top five talent in this draft. There was one team that told me that Jeffrey Simmons was the best player in this draft. Now also keep in mind, Trey, that he's a torn ACL that he suffered during offseason training. He's a pup candidate, is going to start the season on pup and be reevaluated in October. He could contribute later this season, and there's a chance he won't play at all this year. Obviously a polarizing figure that a lot of teams did a lot of research on, and the Tennessee Titans clearly were comfortable with what they saw, Trey. All right, Mort, Adam, thanks very much. Let's just be clear about this. We're not telling anyone how to think. You right. see that video, you are certainly entitled to your opinions. No one here is suggesting you need to feel one way or the other about what you saw in that video. All we can tell you is what people that have worked with Jeffrey Simmons and coached with Jeffrey Simmons since that incident and what they say about him. He maintained a 4.0 GPA his first semester on campus. He had a 3.0 GPA in human development and family studies. He was a two-time member of the SEC Academic Honor Roll and has been a volunteer on campus and in the community. In fact, the current Mississippi State Athletic Director, John Cohen, said, Jeffrey has checked all the boxes. He has been the model for what you would want in a student athlete. All those things can be true, and you can still be horrified by what you saw from a very emotional reaction from an 18-year-old player who was seeing a member of his family attacked. Yeah, look, th this is a, a situation that I know teams really tried to try very hard to get their hands around, get their arms around, that they really, really went deep, deep into his history to really try and figure out, is this really a isolated incident in a situation where the context is very, very important? And you know what? And they came to their conclusions, and obviously enough teams came to the conclusion that he was contrite enough to where they could move on and get to the football aspect of this, which, as Mort and Adam pointed out, he may not even play this year. And the likelihood that he doesn't play this year is probably greater than the likelihood that he does play. You know, I think the question for everyone to answer is how many of us would like to be judged by things we did in high school? And I think we all can answer that question individually in the private or sanctity of our own homes. I just know this. Everyone I talk to at Mississippi State swears by this young man. Everyone I trust in the SEC that knows this young man swears by his character, his integrity, and his personality. That's nothing a good deed is going to change. Correct. If those three things are in check, he'll be good going forward. That's the one thing he's got to ensure. I, I, I'm not concerned about it. He's a top five player in this draft with his talent. Right. But he's got to continue to prove personality, character, and integrity aren't in check. And if they are, if what people I trust tell me, then I think they got a good player. And again, we're just telling you, we're just telling you what people have said about him. Yes. We are not passing judgment. Yes. And we are, you are entitled to feel any way you want about that. We're just sharing yep. the information that people have given to us about the type of person and the player Jeffrey Simmons has been since that incident. And he knows that incident will haunt him for the rest Correct. of his life. There's, there's no way around that. He's going to have to deal with that everywhere he goes. So the Tennessee Titans take Jeffrey Simmons. Now, the Denver Broncos are on the clock. This, of course, the trade that they made with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Pittsburgh jumped up to 10 uh, to take Devin Bush. Here is Roger Goodell with the pick for the Denver Broncos. With the 20th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Denver Broncos select Noah Fant, tight end, Iowa. Well, we've had a lot of history in this draft, and it just happened again. This is the first time ever we've had two tight ends from the same school go in the first round. TJ Hawkinson went first, and now Noah Fant goes to the Denver Broncos. And Noah Fant was an exceptional all-around athlete, 2016 Nebraska High School State triple jump champion. Uh, there you see the medals. This is a guy who could do anything he wanted when he was in high school. Also won a high school state basketball championship, and he was a monster in the red zone this past season, or this past two seasons, by the way. And we'll get to that in a minute. But as we have noted before with TJ Hawkinson, there is a great tradition between the Iowa Children's Hospital and the Iowa football players because that hospital overlooks Kinnick Stadium. And there is a special message now for Noah Fan. Hi, this is Camden, a patient at University of Iowa Stead Family Children's Hospital. We want to congratulate Noah Fant on being selected to the NFL Draft. 
Congratulations, Noah. That is five-year-old Camden. He is doing the best he can, and he is happy because Mel Noah Finn is a pretty good player. He is. Where's Joe Flacco? Wherever Joe Flacco is, tight end should be drafted. Joe had Dennis Pitta, Baltimore Ravens drafted two tight ends early last year. Now Denver gets a tight end in Noah Fant for Joe Flacco. We thought maybe TJ Hawkinson, if he were there at 10, he was gone. Now you get his teammate Noah Fant. He played in the shadow of Hawkinson to a so to a certain extent this year, but he did have 18 touchdown receptions over the last two seasons. He's a gifted athlete, over 6'4", 250 pounds, runs 4'5". He is a stretch the middle receiving option in the passing game, the deep middle area. I thought he could get the job done as a blocker at times, but he was inconsistent in that area. Concentration at times will be cause a drop pass, which shouldn't happen. I want to see if Noah Fant becomes a guy who loves the game or plays it because he can. Now I think if he shows that and comes in with a little bit of chip, saying, hey, Hawkinson went top 10, I'm better. I think there's going to be some friendly competition there that maybe pushes Noah Fant to live up to all that potential. By the way, I'm just fascinated that he can do the triple jump. Listen, uh, how, how many of us could even try to triple jump? I pulled a hamstring <laughs> when you said triple jump. I mean, seriously. Just so people understand what a target he was in the red right. zone the last two years. 21 targets, 15 receptions, 12 touchdowns. You want to talk about a guy that you can go post up yes. when you get down to the yes. end zone? Noah Fant is that dude. Nashville, you are that town tonight, baby. The draft continues. This is the 2019 NFL Draft, presented by Cordia. More driven. Time to take a look at Mel's best available now. Mel is brought to you by Courtyard, but you knew that. Pass rusher Montez Sweat. You think about what the medical situation has done. Would have been a top 10 pick, pretty much guaranteed. Josh Jacobs, an all-around complete running back, run, catch, and block. He said we thought maybe the Oakland Raiders could be a good landing spot for him. Juwan Taylor, a baller at right tackle. Pass protection continues to improve. And Darnell Savage Jr., one of my favorites. This is a guy will hit you. He'll cover, ran 4-3-6, seven interceptions the last two years. One heck of a a football player for the Maryland Terrapins. And there's the howitzer for an arm. We talked about Drew Locke and the improvement right. he showed late this season. I tell you what, we thought Drew Locke might be gone by now. Denver passed on him at 10. They passed on him at 20. Here's Drew Locke still on the board late in round one. All right, there has been a trade. Green Bay has moved up to take Seattle's spot. Seattle moves back to 28. So the Green Bay Packers are waiting, as are the fans at the Stadium View Bar and Grill in Green Bay. So this is a, a situation here where Green Bay has a lot of flexibility. They already went with Sean Gary with their first pick. Where will they go here? Let's go to the commissioner. The Seattle Seahawks have traded the 21st pick to the Green Bay Packers. And with the 21st pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select Darnell Savage. Defensive back, Maryland. Okay. By the way, I love the reaction. I've never heard of that player, but I'm cheering for him. Uh, this is a guy, Darnell Savage, who, by the way, has been a riser since the end of the season. Has really been coming up the boards. Heck of a football player. You talk about versatility, and we always say, who fits today's NFL? Darnell Savage Jr. does. Seven interceptions, as I said, the last two years. Really good ball skills. Fourth in total tackles. We talk about second on the team in tackles for a loss. Ohio State game, he's all over the field. Michigan game, he's got six tackles and an interception. He can cover in the slot. He's a guy who has great range. Four, three, six, yeah, red. red. Great athletic ability, that 40 vertical. There's nothing this kid really can't do. And with Maryland, he was a big time talent and a guy who tested well. As I said, he's got incredible versatility and he will be a huge addition to that Green Bay Packers secondary. Look, the, pack, the Packers got nothing out of the safety position last year and they needed to upgrade it. They tried to upgrade it with Adrian Amos. They're gonna now see what they can do get out of Darnell Savage. I'll just say this, this kid is a heat seeking missile. When he's coming forward, when he's coming downhill, when he's entering into the run front, he's gonna throw all 198 pounds at you. It's not always gonna work. He misses some tackles because he's not smart. He's not very, he's small, he's not very big. And in the back end, when it comes to deep field route combinations, while he has tremendous speed and he has tremendous range, 
he has some issues back there as far as playing them correctly. But I can see why teams were hot on him yeah. because of the physical upside. But he still has some work to do, and the Packers need some big plays out of safety. He says he compares his game to Bears Pro Bowl safety Eddie Jackson. Do you see some of that? I don't see. He doesn't have the same deep field instincts, no. Okay. He has better athletic ability, better raw speed, and will come downhill and try to thump you. But Eddie is one of the most instinctive players in the NFL, period, as far as picking the ball up in the back end. The interesting thing here, Book, is that the Packers, with new first-year head coach Matt LaFleur, have been all in, whether in free agency or in the draft now, on the defensive side of the ball. They got two pass rushers in free agency. Now they make up a defensive end or maybe a guy who played a different position in Rashawn Gary and now a safety. Aaron's like, hello, <laughs> hello. Well, I, I, I think if you're Aaron Rodgers, you're saying, okay, with the scheme that Matt LaFleur is going to bring in, we'll be able to move the football. Aaron could use a wide receiver. We know that. But right. I take this as, hey, Mike Pettin, knock, knock. Your move, big fella. Defensive big, coordinator. Big, Mike, defensive coordinator Mike Pettin. We're giving you all the tools that you need. Preston Smith, Desar uh, Zadaria Smith, right. Kenny Clark, Rashawn Gary, Adrian Amos, and now Darnell Savage. Mike Pettin, this defense better shape up really, really fast. And if you're a Packer fan, you're sitting home saying, what about Hollywood Brown? Correct. Mm. We don't have Randall Cobb anymore. DK we Metcalf. We want to yes. help out Aaron sure. Rodgers. Paris what a, Campbell. What about a guy like Hollywood Brown? Mm. He's coming off that Liz Frank surgery. The Baltimore Ravens, you would think, would have an interest in him. They need wide receivers. They also need an interior lineman like Eric McCoy from Texas A&M. Love had mocked to the Ravens all along. But Hollywood Brown's kind of an X factor in this draft sure. with the injury, but the big playability. This is a kid can really get it done at the pro level if he can stay healthy right. at 166 pounds we've had another trade so this is back-to-back -back slots where we've had a trade move up philadelphia is now on the clock it was baltimore so baltimore has moved back and there by the way their first draft without their legendary gm and hall of fame tight end ozzy newsome so philly has moved up to the 22nd overall pick and to do that they get the 25th overall pick baltimore does plus a fourth rounder and a sixth rounder this year. So pretty decent capital to move up a couple, a few spots, right? Yeah, it, it is. And you know what, for the Philadelphia Eagles, you wonder, is this where, sitting right around here at 22, is this where the first corner really comes mm. off the board? Right. Because mm. this is what they need. They mm. need outside cover lane people Are you here. saying they might be getting greedy for a pick? They could be. <laughs> is that it, a possibility? It, it, it could be one of these situations. I think that is the position that makes sense. I think this is where maybe they start to come off the board. Maybe they have their eye on someone. We'll have to wait and see. All right, the other one might be if you're cornered DeAndre Baker. Sure. Byron the, Murphy. Yes, Byron Murphy out of There's Washington. Some good players yep. By the way, here. is every Washington defensive back over the last six years going to get drafted? It's unbelievable <laughs> the run that they've done uh, uh, up there at, at, uh, with the Huskies. It's been absolutely fantastic. So DeAndre Baker was the Jim Thorpe Award winner yep. for the best uh, cornerback. A lot of people like Greedy Williams. Uh, game out of LSU, and of course you mentioned Byron Murphy. So we'll Who see what happens. Who may be the safest of them all? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've mean, yeah. got a lot of depth at corner. Justin yeah. Lane, Michigan State. Yeah. Rock, Rock, Yassin Temple. There's a whole there's, there's a hey, David Long out of it, Michigan. It, it, it could start a run yeah. on yeah. corners. It, it makes look sense. at that crowd. It makes and you know what they're all saying? That crowd is like, which corner is going to be the first one coming off the board? That looks if like New Year's Eve. Well, Happy New Year because we're here, and Happy New Pick because here's Roger Goodell. The Baltimore Ravens have traded the 22nd pick to the Philadelphia Eagles. With the 22nd pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select Andre Dillard, tackle, Washington State. So much for that cornerback context. <laughs> but here's what it is. This is also history. Andre Dillard becomes the first ever Washington State offensive lineman to come off the board in the first round. And Mel, this was a kid who arrived at Pullman at 240 pounds. He had put on a ton of weight, and he used to wake up at 2 a.m. every night to drink a protein shake just to put the pounds on and then go back to sleep. It has paid off now as he is a first-round pick. Yeah, played basketball until the eighth grade. Then he yep. started to play football, Trey. Right? And you talk about a guy who added a lot of weight to his frame, red-shirted as a freshman, played in three games early on. Then he becomes the starting left tackle. 39 starts over the last three seasons. His forte is pass protection. And you got Carson Wentz, who has had injury issues both in college and in the National Football League. You got to keep your franchise quarterback healthy. Andre Dillard has been a pro-style pass blocker. 
Obviously, he's got to become multi-dimensional and move defenders off the line. He doesn't have great arm length for a left tackle. That's Sir Jonah Williams' arm from Alabama, longer than Andre Dillard's. But here's the guy, proven entity, good feet, senior bowl situation, wasn't the best for his mobile in the game, but a guy who I think certainly because of the situation with Wentz, Lewis yep. is a guy who's going to be put on the spot. The pressure's going to be on this kid to do as good a job in pass protection in the NFL as he did at Washington State. Yeah, what's interesting is, look, when you're looking at team building, right, the Eagles have a lot of guys whose contracts are coming up along the offensive line. One of them happens to be Jason, look, Jason Peters is 37 years old. Yeah. He can't play forever. Andre, you just wonder, are they going to move Lane Johnson? Or are they going to keep Lane Johnson at right tackle? Or are you just going to plug Andre Dillard in at left tackle? And I'll just tell you this about Dillard, too. As much as pass protection is his forte, there were some games where you sat and you watched him, like in, in the senior bowl in particular. Yeah, he got bad games. He got whipped. Yeah. I mean, he got whipped with power. He got whipped with speed. He has some technique deficiencies. Well, they're going to have to really coach him up. He's well, a tremendous athlete. Well, look at his testing say, numbers. Let me say one Air thing raid here. offense. They don't, don't, yeah. don't do a lot of running. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, but, you know, look. His testing numbers are spectacular. His upside is spectacular. They're just going to do Howie some more. Howie Roseman knew the Houston Texans had been mocked Andre Dillard all along. They need to protect the Sean Watson. The Eagles moved ahead one spot of the Houston Texans to get Andre Dillard ahead of Houston, right. who has the same concern. Yep. The Sean Watson's been hit too much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wait, Carson Wentz has to stay Absolutely he has. It Meanwhile, Andre, in his own words, went from a wuss to a wow in football because he hated it when he first started. But let's go more on Andre Dillard and what he thinks now about Saying fly, Eagles fly. DXL takes us down to Susie Culver, standing by with Andre Dillon. Susie. Andre, so much emotion in the green room with your family when that call came in. What were you feeling? Oh, I was feeling every emotion in the book. I just, I was anxious. I had to keep standing up. It was just such an amazing moment to share with everybody. I can, I'm speechless right now. You know, GMs tell me that you're one of the nicest guys in the draft, but man, you are nasty on the field. How do you turn that on? You know, I just I know what I got to do when I got to do it. So, you know, off the field, I just like being somebody that people like to be around. But when I'm on the field, I just I know I got to do my job. So. Eagles fans are going to love them. Susie, Andre, thanks very much. So Andre Dillard, perhaps Howie Roseman doing an end run as Mel Kiefer Jr. alluded <laughs> to, knowing that there are issues for the Houston Texans. All right, let's take a look at a prime performance brought to you by Whole Foods now, and that's a look at what was going on with the Houston Texans. It wasn't a great start. We all knew that. Well, first of all, you go to Foxborough for week one, unless you're the Chiefs on Thursday night, you're going to lose. Uh, they started the season 0-3, and you could see the frustration, but they bounced back to win nine straight, including that overtime game against the Dallas Cowboys, and they won the AFC South only the sixth team since 1980 to make the playoffs after an 0-3 start in the playoffs they lost to one of the hottest teams in football the indianapolis colts who got out to a strong start and took it to them early winning 21 to 7. so look bill o'brien's texans have been consistent playoff teams but winning games in the playoffs outside of that one year depleted with the uh, raiders has been a problem yeah it has and look team building again mel alluded to it you see the graphic on your screen right there, 62 sacks last year. They've taken him down. The pressure rate on Deshaun Watson last year, it's just something that can't be sustained. He will not last. He will not last. They have to find offensive line help in this draft. Now that Andre Dillard is guard, gone, where do they go? Look, Cody Ford is one of my favorite players in this draft. I mean, Dustin Reiser is sitting there. Which offensive tackle do they like here? Yeah. Will they go ahead and just take one and just start a run on the offensive lineman as far as offensive tackles are concerned? Jawan Taylor is still there. Who is it, who's it going to be? Because they have to protect their oh, franchise. You're quarterback. right, they do. So of those players, you just mentioned three that are really good. Which one do you like the best? Oh, Cody Ford, I think, yeah. is a monster. I think he's an absolute monster. I think he's physical in the run game. I don't think his technique is perfect. I don't think his athletic ability is perfect. But I'll tell you this, people don't beat him. And yeah. when he beats you, he beats you down. And, and Cody and, can play guard or attack also. Exactly. exactly. Are you surprised he hasn't come off the board yet? No, not really. Not really. I think I think the league valued these guys where they are right now, and now you're going to see them start coming, just like we'll see the corners eventually start coming off. All right. Roger Goodell making his way to the podium. Let's see if indeed it is another offensive lineman. With the 23rd pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Houston Texans select Titus Howard, tackle, Alabama State. There we go. Okay. 
It just got interesting. For those that don't know, Titus Howard was a 6'3", 235-pound quarterback when he was in high school. And he said, I remember my last game in high school because I had 16 carries for 315 yards rushing. I knew it was gonna be my last game as a quarterback. I wanted to make the most of it. And now he has put on a ton of weight and is a 322 pound 6'5 Mel first round offensive tackle. Here's a kid you think about in terms of Teron Armstead. Kid out of came out of Arkansas, Pine Bluff, the New Orleans Saints. And I think they expect this kid to be that kind of player. Look about the feet, the balance, and the athleticism. He has that. He's still a work in progress. But here's a kid kept getting better and better, obviously adjusting to the position change because he's an athlete. And that's what I think they're looking for. The upside that this kid has. We talked about the neat area that they have as well to protect their quarterback, and that's going to be what he's going to be expected to make that transition to the smaller college level, as Armstead did incredibly effectively. He's yeah. one of the best in the business. So I think if, if this kid can have half the career that Armstead has, they'll be okay. Yeah. By the way, just so people know, he grew two inches and gained 87 pounds since his high school playing days. Look, there's another, there another offensive lineman who came out in the draft a couple of years ago named Lane Johnson, who kind of had the same kind of career right. path. Yeah, quarterback, exactly. tight end, moved off at the tackle. Now he's one of the baddest dudes in the NFL. So, look, this is a good pick for them. They needed it. He has some real good film. His senior bowl film, fantastic. He's one of those guys who you knew was, you know, he, talk about late risers. This is yeah. a guy whose name started circulating a lot over the past couple of years. By the way, the first ever Alabama State player to go in the first round of the common draft era, and the most recent since Tavares Jackson. Stay with us. How you doing, Nashville? We saw pillows. And I think pretty quickly we're going to be talking running back. Who made that rule anyway? You can't pick one in the first round. Who made that rule? I did. You wouldn't have taken Emmett Smith or no. Tony Dorsett no. or Jim Brown. No. I mean, <laughs> I'm tired of talking to you about this running back thing. I mean, you change your, your coat, you're like a chameleon. Hey, that is not true, Gruden, because let me tell you one thing here. You got two backs, right? Do you take Elliott thinking he's better for our offensive line system and our blocking scheme than the other two we have, or do you go away from it? I said last year, if I got a head coach and a coordinator banging on a table and the grade is where it needs to be, in Elliott's case, it's eight on the board. That's high enough. It was 18. I'd say no way. So if you want him, you want it, Gurley? I'd say, hey, Gurley's grade was high enough. Go ahead and take him. I personally, if I were a GM, my philosophy is never, whether it's Adrian Peterson or your Cadillac Williams, I would never <laughs> take a running back in round one. By the way, tremendous troll there, Mel <laughs> Kuyper Jr., throwing in Cadillac there because that, oh. that wasn't the greatest. And we play this because the Raiders are on the clock and – Mel, you want to have anything you say to one of our dear friends, John Gruden? I'm not battling. It was philosophy. And I said, if a grade is in line to take a running back right. and you pound the table, you got to have him. As long as the grade is okay, then I would say, okay, you got to have him. He's the missing link. Take him. Otherwise, no. It's like when John's looking at Josh Jacobs, he's got a complete back. His grade is in line with where they're picking. I would say if John Gruden's pounding that table, I'll sign off. But it's, if he's got a... 35th or the 40th grade on the board, I'm not right, taking him in the right. first round. That's all my point was. I prefer to go another route. John's going to take the running back. And if he doesn't take Josh, hold take on. him. Mel, hold on. He's wasting his time. Hold on. The pick is in. Let's see what happens. Raiders' second first round pick. With the 24th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Oakland Raiders select Josh Jacobs. Running back, Alabama. <laughs> hey, there it is. The Raiders take Josh Jacobs out of Alabama. Split time, of course, with Najee Harris and everybody else. And Damon Harris as well this year for the Crimson Tide. Josh Jacobs had trouble getting recruited, despite the fact that in high school, he averaged 200 plus something yards a game and almost 15 yards a carry. Yet somehow he fell through the cracks. So someone told him to take a look at using an Instagram or Twitter account. So he made a Twitter account called I am Josh Jacobs. And lo and behold, he put his video out there and everybody started flocking to his games. Look, I'm going to tell you something about Josh Jacobs. 
This is a man when he runs the football now. <laughs> and you better buckle up your chin strap and make sure you have a mouthpiece. And if you don't have a mouthpiece, then you don't value your teeth very much. Because this guy is going to finish on you. He can run in a zone scheme. He can run in a power scheme. He's a guy who can run between the tackles. He doesn't have breakaway speed, but he has enough speed to produce 20 plus 20 yard runs on the perimeter. He's a guy who wants to get it north and south. And trust me, he's not looking for the sideline when he finishes his runs. He's looking for you. What do I like about him the most though? The willingness of him to block both in the run game and in pass protection. He's fantastic. You know, I love him. He's got great change of direction, great vision, great instinct. He wasn't overutilized at Alabama, only about 250 carries. So you're getting on back that's relatively fresh. Don't tell me about his top end speed that he can't go 80 yards. How many backs in the National Football League can? He's a guy that you can give. He can play three downs. And like Lewis said, he's physically tough. And having played for John Groot, he loves a physically tough running back. 11 of his 16 touchdowns came this year, guys. 463. Fewer carries than Devin Singletary, who's a Florida Atlantic running back, could be a fourth round draft choice. Yeah, right. 463 fewer carries. And the kid's going to be That's drafted amazing. over the next couple days. Yeah. You think about that. A lot of tread left on those tires yeah. for one Josh Jacobs, who wasn't even expected. Damian Harris was expected to be a higher pick back in August yeah. than Josh Jacobs. And here he is because he yeah. put it all together for that one season. Well, they like it at the Legend Sports Bar in Las Vegas. By the way, Josh Jacobs has been through some stuff. Uh, he and his dad, they sometimes were living homeless. They had to live in the car. When he actually went to Alabama, he preferred to live, uh, be on the floor, sleep on the floor instead of in the bed because it just felt more comfortable to him with the way things have gone. But time now for a relentless moment brought to you by Century 21. And it is a serious, serious look at Josh Jacobs and what he can do. Yeah. So Josh Jacobs doing a good job there. And now time for Choose Wisely presented by Disney's Aladdin. And they've got two of their three picks taken. And do we believe that they have chosen wisely when you look at what's going on here? Because the Raiders needed a running back. It's basically, they had Jalen Richard and but he, but he, but he, that's all, folks. I mean, if you look at the Oakland Raiders pick right now, I think we all think they reached with Cleveland Farrell. But this Josh Jacob pick, it fits. He's tough. Gruden likes tough people. He loves guys that love football. So this, this pick fits, whereas the defensive end pick in Cleveland Farrell fits. What's your we favorite don't know if word? the right guy. Well, yeah, look, your favorite word? Physicality. Always. That's Josh Jacobs. Look, one, yeah. of the, one of the things that Mike Mayock and John Gruden have talked about is they want guys who play the way they want them to play, okay? And Josh Jacobs, I'm sure if you went down to Alabama and you asked Nick Saban about this, this guy play the way that you would project or rather, you would want your guys to play out in yeah. Oakland, given what Mike Mayock said. Look, you can turn on the tape, man. And if you're a defensive player and you have played any level of football and you see this guy coming, yeah. look, he plays the way they want him to play. And you know what? The point that you make about the amount of tread left on his tires, what does everybody talk about when they're talking about value in running backs? Oh, he has too many carries. Yes. Oh, he yeah. doesn't have a whole lot of tread left on his tires. Oh, you got to get rid of those guys much sooner rather than later. Josh Harley has any. So, I mean, what do you want? It's just a matter of, again, what price do you pay? I'm, I'm good with this pick because this is what this this kid's fantastic. Remember everybody said that John Gruden loved Drew Locke at right. the Senior Bowl. Yeah. And Derek Carr. Derek Carr was an MVP candidate not mm. long ago when he had mm. some talent around. 2016. Him. Josh Jacobs will help Derek Carr. They made a ton of. They brought in like 20 guys in free agency. Look, They're doing a lot to try to help Derek Carr and Josh Jacobs to go a long way. In they've the done some good yeah. things on the offensive side of the ball as far as the people they've added. Look, I, they I, needed it, a runner. It's been a real turnover. I think right now only 13 players. Uh, are still on the Raiders roster from when they had that first game Monday night under John Gruden in the doubleheader against the Rams. So there has been a massive turnover, and Josh Jacobs will be a massive upgrade. They have one more uh, crack at this, uh, the Raiders do, when they pick 27th overall. But right now, the Baltimore Ravens are on the clock, and this is a new era. Mel, because they have a new general manager, yeah. Ozzie Newsom is not there anymore. It's Eric DaCosta. He's done a heck of a job for Ozzie Newsom over the years. They have a big need at wide receiver. And here's Hollywood Brown sitting there. They also have a big need for a center guard, a versatile kid like Eric McCoy from Texas A&M. I've been mocking him there all along. But if Marquise Brown is here, that's going to be the debate. I didn't get the receiver. Remember, they had the tight ends in Mark Andrews. And now they hope a right. healthy Hayden Hurst yep. this year. They need a receiver like Hollywood Brown. Eric McCoy, that's the debate. One of those two. I I don't think you can go wrong with. All right, we'll find out. Let's go to our uh, draft expert, Todd McShay. Todd, what are you thinking and what are you hearing right now? Yeah, Mel just mentioned wide receiver. We knew the wide receivers were going to fall. Marquise Brown right now, the number two player left on my board. 
Baltimore needs offensive line, but Baltimore needs playmakers and difference makers. So only 166 pounds. He's got the Liz Frank injury, but he's going to be ready for the season. I think the perfect fit right here would be Marquise Brown. And if he doesn't go at 25, I think 26 is a strong possibility to the Indianapolis Colts as well. So this wide receiver group starts with Marquise Brown. There's a lot of depth. We'll see a bunch of guys come off the board tomorrow. But Brown is the one receiver that I truly believe belongs in the first round. All right, Todd, thanks. We'll see if that happens. And again, keep in mind, we're in the back third of the, uh, the, the final quadrant of the, uh, of the draft. And the last time we didn't have a wide receiver taken in the first round was 2008. Mel, I know the only one you projected in your final mock was Marquise Brown, and you have him still at the top of the list. Exactly. And if it hadn't been for the injury and wondering whether he'll be ready for training camp, he would have probably gone earlier. Nikhil Harry's hot. He's in that late first, early second round discussion. I'm actually at the Arizona Cardinals first pick in round two. Look at him to really provide some offensive production for Kyler Murray in that passing game. DK Metcalf had injuries two of the last three years, only 67 career catches, but he's a physically talented receiver. And his teammate A.J. Brown had a heck of a career. Then you got Debo Samuel Great, great after great catch. Slot receiver. There's some good looking receivers going to be a bit. We said it'd be a great second round receiver right. group. A, yeah, and that will be in a great second round defensive back group, which it will be. Uh, tune in tomorrow night. There's going to be some big time <laughs> players. Well, Paris Campbell drafted. might be drafted yep. tomorrow night. Hakeem Butler, the Miles kid out of Boykin, Iowa State. Miles Boykin out of Notre Dame. A lot of potentially really, really good wide receivers. Okay, so we'll see what happens with the Ravens are doing again. They traded back for this pick. The Baltimore Ravens getting ready. Hey, buddy. Uh, getting ready to pick the uh, 20 minute overall you. selection. Hey, buddy, let's go to Roger Goodell. With the 25th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Baltimore Ravens select Marquise Brown, wide receiver, Oklahoma. So Baltimore is going to Hollywood. By the way, Marquise Brown is a fascinating story. He's cousins with Antonio Brown. He's never going to weigh more than 170, 175 pounds, but the kid can flat out fly. He was born two weeks early, as I said, cousin of Antonio Brown. He has the Liz Frank injury that he's having to deal with here, right? Exactly, and that makes it questionable, obviously, for OTAs, for training camp. When will he be ready to go? The Ravens have not had good luck drafting wide receivers. That's the one position Ozzie Newsom kind of struggled at, the organization as a whole has struggled at. Here's, Here's the, the kid. You talk about dynamic, I call him a diminutive dynamo, Lewis and Booger, with the ball in his hands. He's electric. You got to keep him healthy, though. He has had some injuries at Oklahoma in terms of being able to have to go to the sideline. Lines, but 166 pounds, will he ever be 175? We'll see. But if you can keep him on the field for Lamar Jackson, who's got to improve as a passer, this kid, I'll tell you what, what's underrated about him, he's tough. If you look at how Baltimore is going to play, they're obviously going to run the football. Teams are going to bring seven and eight guys up, that extra guy in the box, to stop the run. What is that going to create? A lot of one-on-one -on -one opportunities on the outside. Lamar Jackson, can he hook up with Hollywood Brown? Look, and here, here's the thing about, about Hollywood Brown. You, can, you need to get him the ball quickly. If you want to increase Lamar Jackson's completion percentage and the wide receivers and their yards after the catch per reception, get him the ball quickly. And that's one of the things you can do with him. He, you're, you're seeing all these highlights of him just blowing past people down the field. But think about this. Think about the ways in which some of the more creative offenses use weapons like this. Put him in the backfield. Throw him bubble screens. Throw him rocket screens. Throw him swing passes. Get him the ball quickly. Get some blockers out in front of him. It doesn't always have to be nine routes down the field because this kid can do it all. Look, he, to me, is Deshaun Jackson Jr. That's Whoa. what he's like. Okay? And, I, and I'm telling you, I know there's some people who are worried about his list, Frank. From what I've been told, look, if you're not going to draft him because he's not going to be ready for OTAs and minicamp, then you're going to miss out on something in training camp in the regular season because he's electric. Here's a bigger question. Do we think he can help Lamar Jackson? That's the that, bigger question. That, that's what I'm saying. If you're just going to send him on nine routes and, and post and post corners and expect Lamar to be one of those guys who automatically just miraculously become a deep down the field outside the, outside the numbers passer, it's not going to happen. Right, no. You're going to have to be creative with how you yes. use him. Listen, yeah. well, this kid was creative in finding a way to play. All his offers fell through after his high school days, so he went to the College of the Canyons in L.A., and they couldn't pay for everything, so he got a job working the roller coasters at Six Flags Magic Mountain and Google Rooms for Rent and found one and his roller coaster salary <laughs> allowed him to get by in the greater Los Angeles area. Hey listen, <laughs> every day you gotta find you a gotta way. Hustle.
So it, it was a remarkable story. I mean, he, he had a couple of offers. Utah State looked like it was going to be there. And he's admitted, look, I'm never going to be a 190-pound guy. Right. I'm going to be 175 pounds dripping wet at my best. But when you're that freakishly fast, you don't have to. But Antonio Brown is only about 180, what, 180, 183 pounds, right? Yeah, look, when, when Sean Jackson came out of Cal, there yeah. were many people who were saying the same thing. Yeah. He's so small. He's a one-trick pony. He will never Good last trick, in the though. NFL. He's the kind of guy you just can't afford. You know what? And I know there were people who were thinking, if we could get Marquise Brown in the second round, that'd be great. Yeah. He wasn't going to last yeah. until there because they yeah. saw what Deshaun Jackson could do to the NFL. Yeah, well, listen, if, if Hollywood can do that, they'll be very happy with this pick. DXL takes us down to Susie Calver, Calver standing by right now with Hollywood Brown. Hollywood, what a journey. So much to overcome to get here. What makes you most proud of this journey? Man, just, just the perseverance I had. Just no, nobody knew what I had to go through. And you know, I'm just proud right now. I just thank God. I thank my family. And, you know, I, I thank the Ravens organization for believing in me. Ravens fans should know. What are some of those things you've fought through? Uh, you know, I've been having to deal with, you know, people say I'm, I'm too small. I went to junior college, you know, I worked, I worked my tail off, and here I am today, man. I just thank God. Well, you've been fighting back from a foot injury. Everybody wants to see you yeah. fly. What's the timetable? Yeah, man. Uh, I've been gaining a lot of confidence. I'll be back at training camp, and, you know, I'm ready to light the NFL up. <laughs> we can't wait to see it. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, Susie, thanks. So Washington once again on the clock with pick 26 as we're getting close. And finally the wait for Marquise Hollywood Brown was over. The raw motion such a big part of the draft. This is the 2019 NFL Draft presented by Courtyard. Welcome back to the 2019 NFL Draft, presented by Courtyard. All right, welcome back. We have a trade with the 26th pick overall. Washington has traded with Indianapolis. So, amazingly, Washington just had their quarterback, Dwayne Haskins, fall into their lap at 15 without having to make a trade. They now make a trade at 26. Let's find out what they're doing with it. The Indianapolis Colts have traded the 26th pick to the Washington Redskins. And with the 26th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Washington Redskins select Montez Sweat, linebacker, Mississippi State. Okay, you heard earlier from Adam and Mort that a lot of people felt that Montez Sweat stock may be dropping. He drops to 26. He's a kid that went to Michigan State, had some issues there, uh, transferred away after some suspensions there, was by all indications a really good player, and there were no issues for him at Mississippi State, and then Mel blew the field away at the combine with that 4-4-140, fastest time by a defensive lineman since 2006. Talking about sack production and an incredible workout. You're talking about 6'5 and a half, almost 6'6, 260. He's a pounds. freak. To run 4'4'1 four, four, is rare, guys. You just don't see that very often over the last 30, 40 years. And the incredibly long arms, the 21 reps. So he's got the upper body strength as well, 36 vertical. This is a gifted athlete. Here's Watch him run here. Yeah. That is flying for a 260 pounder, 4'4'1. Four, four, Cornerbacks can't run that fast, so wide receivers can't. Montez Sweat as a sack production 22 sacks over the last two years at Mississippi State he got a little quiet after early October where a lot of his sacks came mid early October over the next six games quiet then the final two games of the regular season he was sacking quarterbacks again obviously having Jeffrey Simmons inside to collapse things sweat was the outside force guys the Redskins need a pass rusher Ryan Kerrigan can't do it all Preston Spitz now a Green Bay Packer. Obviously, you think about the Redskins' need area. Pass rusher was number one. They couldn't pass up Wayne Haskins. Now they come back into the first round to get Montez Sweat close. If you look at the board and you talk about value, best value, best player available at the time you pick, I think the Redskins had to look at this board and be like, my goodness, we can get this guy at this pick? 
a long, explosive defensive end that can play the run or pass. We don't have many of those on the, on the NFL level. Guys that are versatile that can play both run and pass, he can do that. He's, Look, ta he's tailor made for their scheme. Yeah. He's Look, they lose Preston Smith, they get Montez Sweat for value, especially if their medical staff said, yes. we're on the side yeah. of feeling as though we're okay with this. It's perfect for him. You're right, Ryan Carrick can get to it on, get to it on his own. And Ryan Anderson hasn't proved he can do it yet. You need this player. Well, to your point, the medical issue was there, were cons there was a concern with his heart. Right. Much in the same way, although not as severe to a lot of people, what happened with Maurice Hurst, the defensive lineman out of Michigan a year ago. But that's just part of the reason why some people felt Montez Sweat would fall. And we alluded to it earlier with Adam and Mort. Let's go back to them now. Well, one thing I would add, Trey, is that in talking to some teams, it, they like the football ability. They obviously like what he did at the combine. As far as the heart goes, some teams took him off the board medically, but basically had the idea that it would simply be a guy that had some risk, but not high, big risk with that heart, and you just it would need to monitor him every year. But some teams also said he did not interview well, did not pass their psychological test that they preferred for a defensive player. And when I spoke to Brian Baker, who was his defensive line coach at Mississippi State, now at Alabama, one thing that he said, and he said he talked to teams about this, he said if you, he needs to go to the right team with the right coach, he does not respond to somebody yelling at him, pushing him too much. He said he'll be a good player in the league if he gets the right coach with the right team. And he was viewed as a top player, and I think the Washington Redskins come out ahead here because a lot of people thought they'd have to trade up to get Dwayne Haskins, which they never really intended to do. They sat where they were, and then they could afford to take a little extra draft capital that they saved by getting the quarterback and then trade up to Indianapolis spot and get Montez Sweat, Trey. Yeah, Adam, this is the definition of letting the draft come to you, what Washington yeah. has done here, right? They yeah. didn't. They, they saw the way it was going. They didn't have to reach. They got their quarterback at 15, and they just sat back there and may, may have gotten the best edge presence in this draft in Montez Sweat. Yeah, or, or at least someone who has the best physical measurables yeah. given the scheme that they run, sure. Look, Washington is playing it smart, all right? They let the quarterback come to them. There's many people who go, I don't care that he came to you. There's people right now, if you check social media, you're sitting there going, but Dwayne Haskins has too much bust potential. I mean, get out of here with this stuff. They, they actually are doing a very good job. I'm going to take your Twitter been, away from you, by the way. They have been the past couple of years <laughs> doing a nice job of trying to methodically build this football team. They are, and we'll see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, once, twice, three times a Raider. One more time. <laughs> oh, you've been saving that one. Well, you've been saving that I, one I all actually, day. I'm not going to lie to you. I just thought of it. Uh, so we saw Cleveland Furl early, and then we got Josh Jacobs. Where do they go at 27? Corners got it. Let's find out back. together. Here we go. Commissioner, walking to the podium right now for the Raiders. You are not touching Twitter again tonight. <laughs> stop it. You need to stop looking at your Twitter feed from someone who looks at it a lot. <laughs> With the 27th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Oakland Raiders select Jonathan Abram, defensive back, Mississippi State. So back to back, Mississippi State Bulldogs come off the board. Jonathan Abram, by the way, this is a guy that initially went to Georgia, and then Mark Rick left, and then he said he was kind of lost. He transferred to Jones County Junior College, and then went on to have two really, really good seasons at Mississippi State. And Lewis, this is a guy who does not shy away from contact. That's he right. had a couple of targeting uh, issues he had to deal Yay. with. But he's like, I don't play dirty, I play fast, and I just get there in a hurry. This is a guy who is a very good blitzer, a very good hitter. He's position versatile. He can play free. He can play strong. He plays some nickel. And he's a guy who has very good cover skills as far as being able to cover down on a number three wide receiver in the slot or allowing you to, in your base defense, go ahead and cover a wide receiver so you don't have to go to nickel. He's very, I mean, and he plays the game. I'll tell you what, he doesn't play dirty and he does play fast. He is a blur on the screen. He again fits the mold in terms of what Mike Mayock and John Gruden have said they want in a football player. Highly competitive, loves the game physical player who when he comes down he can cover tight ends he can cover slot receivers a guy that's going to play and make plays around the line of scrimmage with the game of football today being not as much vertical more horizontal zero to 15 yards you need playmakers mm. you need hitters near the line of scrimmage this young man is a hitter and provides a lot of versatility 
for the Oakland Raiders. Proven entities against big time competition. Yes. And I think you look at what Abram did, you look at certainly what Josh Jacobs did, and Farrell at Clemson playing yes. in so many huge games. Gruden and Mayock looking for those types of players in round one. By the way, just the third time in the common draft era, Mississippi State has had a pair of first rounders. Happened last in 1996 and before that, 1982. So they're the Raiders. Did they address their needs? Yes, they did. Jonathan Abram there with his daughter. By the way, already graduated, and he's on to getting his MBA. This kid is going places on and off the football field. But for the moment, he's going to Oakland. And you know, then to Las Vegas. Stay with us, the draft from Nash Vegas continues. It's all music to the ears in Music City. A little bit of country, a little bit of NFL. Ain't nobody like a Nashville party! 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 Like Nashville party. This is the NFL draft! Final five picks of the first round. Drew Locke, the Missouri quarterback, four-year starter, three-time captain, still waiting to hear when his name will be called. Mel Kiefer Jr., time to look at your best available. Of course, it's brought to you by Courtyard by Marriott. There you go, Juwan Taylor, the right tackle out of Florida. There's Drew Locke, second best player on the board right now, according to my ratings. Cody Ford, right tackle, but has guard experience as a starter at Oklahoma. Real tough, aggressive football player. Byron Murphy, all the corners are still there. Right. Byron Murphy leads the way, a playmaker at Washington, more of a slot corner. And there's a versatile center guard, Eric McCoy out of Texas A&M. All the corners still there. Byron Murphy, Greedy Williams, LSU. DeAndre Robinson, Baker. Temple, DeAndre Baker, Justin Lane, Michigan State. The list goes on and on. That's a good group of corners that's going to go at some point late first into the second round. We said 20 yeah. to 22 DBs in the first two rounds. That second round is going to be loaded with defensive backs and wide receivers. By the way, kudos to Byron Murphy doing the shoot with his uh, shirt open. I mean, as a confident young man. Back in the day, Booger would have done that, but you know, <laughs> that was back in the day. So the Chargers are on the clock. They made it to the postseason. They had the win in Baltimore, taking down the Ravens, then of course went to New England. We know how that usually goes. Mm -hmm. Well, they were playing from behind in that game because they didn't have the linebackers. They were so banged up. They were playing seven defensive backs, and they just handed the ball to Sony Michelle in that game, and he just pounded them down. So the Chargers, where will they go? The pick is in. Let's see what Roger Goodell has in store for us as L.A. Chargers getting set to announce their selection in the first round of the 2019 NFL Draft. With the 28th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Los Angeles Chargers select Jerry Tillery, defensive tackle, Notre Dame. This, in many ways, is a fascinating pick. First and foremost, Jerry Tillery is celebrating his draft in Maui. So, by the way, <laughs> A, that is one smart dude. B, kudos, you figured it out. But Jerry Tillery is a fascinating player. He has been about more than football his entire life. When he was five years old, he started to write left-handed just because he wanted to increase the odds of people that were able to do it. He's competed in triathlons. He did a hedge fund in Ireland during college. He graduated already. Yeah. How's it, Jerry Tillery? Nicely done on your part. He did have an incident in a game Notre Dame played against USC where he stomped on a couple of players. He's apologized for that. But this is a guy who has done a lot of life experiences, Mel. There's always one player. Does he love football? When you see his highlights, what do you think? As a Notre Dame fan, you saw him flash that kind of ability. You see the game here against Stanford. He had sack after sack in this game. He was a one-man wrecking crew uh, in that particular football game. But there were games where he was quiet. See him here, blocking the, the field goal. You can see that. You see evidence that he can be a great football player. But in too many games, in my opinion, he wasn't as dominant. He was too quiet. So if he can just turn it loose and be more consistent, guys, then you got something. You know, when you see Jerry Tillery, the first thing that comes to my mind is Richard Seymour, a long guy that's powerful and has the quickness inside. Can play in a 4-3 or a 3-4, maybe best suited 
for that 4-I in a 3-4 defense. I love the player. I like how long and strong he is. He gives you a lot of skin. And they are soft in the yeah, belly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you, you, just, you just brought that point up, exactly didn't you? In the playoff game. They need big bodies in there. You're talking about a guy who's 6'6", almost 300 pounds, who has tremendous testing numbers. When it's turned up for him, this kid can wreck shot. Yeah. I mean, he can wreck something. That's why guys fall to this point in the draft. Look, this is a brilliant pick because He's in Hawaii. He's in Maui. He gets it, man. I'm with you, Jerry Tillery. Live your life. Just turn it Stay up, baby. This. If we turn it up. We got to get the draft to Maui. That's what we're doing next. But well, we love you, Nashville. This is the 2019 NFL Draft, presented by Courtyard. Climbing the charts in Nashville. Pick somebody good, baby. Go the clock. Go the clock. Go the clock. Well, glad you're still with us for the first round of the 2019 draft. The Seahawks are on the clock. How did they get here? Because they made the trade that sent their defensive end Frank Clark to Kansas City. Kansas City got a third round pick. Seattle got this pick, a third round pick, 92nd overall, and a 2020 second round pick. In other words, they paid a pretty steep price to get Frank Clark, but they're trying to take advantage of their quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, in his rookie contract going into year three in 2019. So let's take a look at what's going on in Seattle with our GMC professional grade moment. Folks, there's been a lot of changeover at the SeaTac International Airport. Uh, please put your seat in the upright and locked position because since Malcolm Butler's interception in Super Bowl 49 that won the game for the Patriots, very few starters from Seattle remain. Some of the names that are gone, Marshawn Lynch, Michael Bennett, Cliff Avery, Drew Servin, Richard Sherman, Earl Thomas, just to name a few. It has been a massive turnover and Seattle is now banked on Russell Wilson giving him that big contract going forward. It is essentially now the Russell Wilson show in Seattle. It used to be Legion of Boom and then they eh, will get some offense. Now they are all in on making sure Russell Wilson gets that offense. Well I understand that but when you when you trade away Frank Clark you have to provide somebody that's going to rush the passer and provide some solid edge work up front. Yeah, you have Jaron Reed inside, but Frank Clark was a guy who was a beast against the run in the past. So at some point, they're going to have to address that, if not getting Russell Wilson some help on the outside because we know Doug Baldwin is getting a lot older. They like the big receivers. They always have. There are a lot of big wide outs. DK Metcalf. Nikhil Harry, Arizona State. J.J. Arcega, white side for Stanford. Host of big receivers that figure to go late first, early second round. We talked about how many would go. Right now, we have one wide out. Marquise Brown has been taken up till this point. Think about the edge rusher. Is there one right now? Off the edge of speed rusher, Jalen Ferguson's not that kind of guy right. coming out of Louisiana Tech. The guard tackle, Cody Ford, still there out of Oklahoma. Russell Wilson gets hit way too much. He's like, well, I think they does he hold the ball too long? I don't think so. No. I think you've got to protect your franchise better than they do at Seattle. And that comes with the offensive line getting better. They've gotten a little better at that over the last uh, the last year or so. But if you look at team building with this situation in Seattle right now, where do you think is the most pressing need? Well, really, pass rusher. I mean, yeah. really, if you look at it, quarterback, pass rusher, defensive quarter, offensive tackle, wide receiver. You need pass rusher, maybe use another quarter, you need a wide receiver. Now it's, well, okay, now I'm sitting here. What is the best player at those positions? Which one is sticking out? Which one is sitting up there going, okay, this presents the greatest value for us. We're going to have to do some coaching. It's not going to be a ready-made pick. We understand that. But who has been better, quite honestly? Look, remember this. Seattle started its run because Pete could develop people as good as anybody, Correct. especially in the secondary. He developed Richard Sherman. He developed Cam Chancellor. He developed Brandon Browner. He developed a lot of these guys. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them pick a good corner if they think that there's one that fits in this game. Could they take a guy like Jalen Ferguson? Does he fit their profile? This guy who's highly productive as far as rushing the passer. They like Trey Flowers, right. who was a former collegiate safety. Right. They like those big, they like, they like length. That's right. Whether it's a corner, whether it's a wide receiver, that's kind of been I, the profile. I just don't know. I mean, does DK Metcalf really fit? I'm, I don't know, maybe. Maybe they think that that's the kind of long-range burner they could use the guy to go with Doug Baldwin. The, the guy that's going to go at some point sure. is Nikhil Harry. They could, they could Nikhil Harry's going to go, too. You know what? I, I'm, I'll tell you what. From, I, I'm not so sure that he's going to go in the first round. I, no, know he, no. I mean, he's a good player, and second round's going to oh, yeah. provide some tremendous value at that position. 
But you know, it's interesting because DK Metcalf has the profile that they could use. A long range burner, big guy on the outside. Who, who knows if he can become a better route runner? Yeah. Well, we have our doubts, but they need that profile. They need speed. They need, they need at least lifter. one guy. That's right. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, they have. I mean, they have speed, but they need that bigger profile speed, big speed. Well, Could they use it? If you're talking about big speed, there's, <laughs> there's nobody that fits that profile right. like him. Right. Yeah. The DK Metcalf. Sure. I mean, that guy. You know, his father was an offensive lineman who played think, seven seasons see, for the Chicago what Bears. What I say when I say you know they need speed. Look, Tyler Lockett has speed, yeah. right. but the, I'm just talking about the profile of the player. Because when you're building wide receiver cores, you don't want a bunch of small guys. You don't want all tall guys. All right. You want guys who fit roles, and maybe he fits one for them. Well, one thing we always know, Pete Carroll likes to put things out there on Twitter. He put out him playing a song saying, giving out draft clues. I listened to it. I didn't, didn't pick up what he was throwing down. <laughs> maybe it's not my genre. We'll figure it out when we come back. Stay with us. The 2019 NFL Draft is presented by Courtyard by Marriott, the official hotel of the NFL, and in part by Sprint, Switch Today, and Lowe's, official sponsor of the 2019 NFL Draft. All right, welcome back to the draft as we're getting close to the end of the first round. Just a few more picks to go. Mel, give us your best available. You look at the guys in terms of the offensive lineman, Jawan Taylor, that right tackle you can put in there. If his pass blocking keeps improving, he will really affect your running game positively. There's Drew Locke. We talked about Lou, you brought up for the Patriots. Look at him. What does he fall into round two? And then Cody Ford, that aggressive, hardworking, dependable right tackle guard experience at both spots. And I love the corners that are still on the board. I mean, you're getting some great value there. Late first, early second round, led by Byron Murphy, a more of a slot corner. And as I said, Eric McCoy ran 4.89. Once he did that, he's got guard experience as well as being an anchor. Kid's an athlete. I thought, I'm sure he was in that discussion with the Baltimore Ravens. Here he is, though, still available late in round one. All right, so what we've got, the pick is in for the Seattle Seahawks. Where are they going? Let's go to Commissioner Roger Goodell and find out what Seattle is going to do with pick 29 in the first round. With the 29th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Seattle Seahawks select L.J. Collier. Defensive end, TCU. Well, you guys talked about it wanting to be a pass rusher, and it is L.J. Collier, who had two scholarship offers, one to TCU, one to Texas Tech. He chose TCU, and he has put on a show at times. He has, and I think the potential moving forward into the NFL was there. He showed that all-star game as well, did it down there in Mobile. You look at a guy here, doesn't have the incredible elite 40 speed, but when you look at the production, you look at the technique getting off the edge. This is a kid, multi-dimensional bug. That's where some teams will say, well, if you don't run under 4.6547, 4.7, we don't launch a closing. And the NFL is an elite pass runner. Some will say, hey, just go by the production and look at the consistency of L.K. Collier during his career. Mel, the reason I love him, he's an athlete. And just in case he doesn't work out a defensive end, there are people in the National Football League who think you can reduce down and put him over the guard and play him as a three technique. So he provides a lot of versatility. He's a football player, Trey. That's the best. Thing you can say about That's, this young man. You find a way to put him on the field, yeah. he'll show out. Yeah, I think ultimately he may have to reduce down. You know, it's funny, I struggled with LJ. I mean, he's yeah. a guy who has tremendous hand use, has tremendously heavy hands, yeah. but the juice, I yeah. don't know if it's there. We'll find out. Meanwhile, we have the Giants who are back in for a third first round pick. My goodness, what are they going to do? The Seattle Seahawks have traded the 30th pick to the New York Giants with the 30th pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the New York Giants select DeAndre Baker, defensive back, Georgia. And finally, we've got our first cornerback off the board. It's the Jim Thorpe Award winner, DeAndre Baker, that goes to the best cornerback in college football. DeAndre Baker out of Georgia goes to the New York football Very Giants. confident football player. Very confident. Very, you know about confident. When he was playing up against Debo Samuel, Debo said, DeAndre who? 
And uh, yeah, he went out there and he shut him down. And after the game, he said, hey, watch out for number 18. And you saw what 18 did. And he's a kid who, during his career, very consistent football player, very complete. He will tackle you, and he will do the job in coverage. For a 5'11 corner, he's got really good length, long arms that really assist him in coverage in terms of breaking up passes and as well as tackling in the open field. DeAndre Baker didn't run 4'4". Ran 4-5-3, 4-5-2 in that area. So, yeah, here's a guy that doesn't have the elite catch-up speed, but consistency in the SEC against quality wide receivers. And what I like about him, too, in practice, he's going up against B. Cole Hardman. He's going up against Holloman. He's going up against Godwin. He's going up against all these receivers that have a chance to move forward into the National Football League, in addition to guys like Debo Samuel every week in the SEC. You know, when you look at him playing for Kirby Smart and Mel Tucker, they play a lot of different coverage. He can play zone. He can play man. He's an aggressive physical guy. When he gets to the next level, he's just got to clean up his technique just a little bit because he got penalized a lot. But I love this guy as a cornerback. He provides a, a multi-dimensional corner who can come inside and hit you with the best of them. Yeah, I think I think just really the different schemes that he played in as far as cover schemes, yep. whether it be split safety, single safety, up on the line pressing, off with vision to the quarterback. What, the thing I like about him the most, he finishes strong on the football down the field. Highly competitive down the field. The question is, look, he needs to constantly just commit himself to getting to doing all the things between games yeah. and not just wanting to play when the games are there. Uh, interestingly, he grew up in that Liber Liberty City area of Miami that has produced NFL players like Teddy Bridgewater, Chad Johnson, Devontae Freeman, Amari Cooper, T.Y. Hilton, and Antonio Brown. So there, there has been a, a plethora of really good talent coming out of Liberty City. And now the third pick. So the Giants now have a very interesting draft board when you look yeah. at it, Booger. I oh. mean, they, they, they went for uh, Daniel Jones. Mel tried to tell us. <laughs> Mel tried to tell us. We, we didn't want to listen there. And then, of course, uh, Dexter Lawrence. Dexter Lawrence, and now they get DeAndre Baker. Well, they got the guys they targeted. Yeah. Yeah. So they went back in to get Baker. They could have had anybody. Yeah. They could have had any one of the corners. They got their number one corner in DeAndre Baker. You think about going up against Riley Ridley as well. Riley Ridley may be a second-round pick wide receiver sure. out of Georgia. Brother they, out of Calvin Ridley. Exactly. They got Lawrence, the big body up front, and they handpicked the quarterback. They could have had any quarterback. They, after Kyler Murray, they took Daniel Jones. So their number one corner they get, their quarterback that they deem the best after Murray they get, and then they get the big body. The guy that they feel can solidify the middle of that defensive front in Dexter Lawrence. You know, I think for all the questions about Dave Gettleman that we had, I think Dave Gettleman has had one hell of a night. He came in here, he identified the players he wants based on their evaluations, and he got the guys he wants because they were there, and he didn't reach for them. So maybe the Daniel Jones, but that's who they had evaluated as number one, so they got him. So good night for Dave Gettleman. It, listen, it's a good night if Dale, Daniel Jones is that dude. Is it? That, that, that's, that's, according that, that's to their that's board, he well, is. Yeah, according to their board, he is. We'll find out. So there's been another trade now. For pick 31, the Rams have moved out of the first round. A lot of people thought they might do that. Atlanta has stepped in. Atlanta is now picking at 31, and the pick is in. Where will Atlanta go with this pick? They're second in the first round. The Los Angeles Rams have traded the 31st pick to the Atlanta Falcons. With the 31st pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons select Caleb McGarry, tackle Washington. You want to talk about a kid that's had an interesting run to this position and this situation in his life. He was named the winner of the Morris Trophy for the top offensive lineman at Washington. And oh, by the way, when asked about his journey, he says, well, get ready. And it's perfect that he was taken in Nashville because he says, my life is pretty much a country song. We had a family farm in suburban Washington. When the 2008 mortgage crisis fell, we had to sell it. So sure enough, they foreclosed on us. Then his dad got involved in a work accident and lost his job. Then he added, my girlfriend broke up with me and my dog died and we had to move into an RV. This guy has been through a lot of stuff in his life. And then after they moved into the RV in front of his parents' house, the RV burned down. A friend of his called him and said, did you know your house is on fire? And McGarry said, I did not know that. He did not know that his house was on fire. He has been through some stuff, but this is a guy who can play. He can play, and he doesn't have the great length. He doesn't have the long arms that a lot of people want, but he is a physical performer, and he's a good athlete. And if you think about what McGarry's going to mean to the Atlanta Falcon offensive line, they already added 
Chris Lindstrom, who's a pure guard, even though he played some tackle. Look at McGarry. Stone, yeah, he will keep you at bay on a consistent basis. Matt Ryan's your franchise. When he went to the Super Bowl and really should have won it, they had all five starters, never get hurt, missed play every snap. Then the last few years, they've had some injuries and guys not play as well as they had. They needed to solidify that group up front. McGarry and Lindstrom, two guys that I'm sure they feel, Thomas Dimitrov and Scott Pioli feel, are plug-and-play starters as rookies. Look, these are guys who are athletic guys, especially in the run game, who play with a certain attitude. When you watch McGarry in the run game in particular, on down blocks, boom, on the second level. Look, he's trying to punish people, and you're right. He doesn't have ideal leg to play right tackle. I don't know what they do with him and what position ultimately they wind up putting him at, but I can understand the profile between him and Lindstrom. This yeah. is about keeping Matt Ryan upright. You're right. His sacks almost doubled this year from 2017 to 2018. They're making a concerted effort to say, hey, look, that's enough. We're taking care of our quarterback. And oh, by the way, if that wasn't enough, Caleb McGarry also collapsed while playing a basketball game. Turns out he had an arrhythmia. He had to have a heart procedure. And in deadpan fashion said, all they did was they went into an artery with a wire and burned out the short circuit. It's a problem. I'm good. I'm done with it. This is a tough dude who's been through a lot of stuff. And Matt Ryan, as you said, has been through some stuff, and now they've got some protection, they believe, for him up front. They were decimated by injuries on the defensive side of the ball last year. They think they'll be okay there. Sure. This was about making sure Matt Ryan is a productive quarterback for the next two, three, four, five more years. Yeah, look, the draft isn't about picking skill position players so your fan base can go out and buy jerseys. Right. The draft is about taking care of your franchise quarterback, who right now, look, they're paying a lot of money. Right. He cannot take the beating that he took. These are not picks that you sit there and you get excited about, but these guys are good football players who play with a certain DNA as far as how they play the game. You got to tip your hat to them. They are, they are taking a very methodical, disciplined approach and saying, hey, look, we build it inside out. Yep. We build it front to back, and we're going to take care of our quarterback. Boy, and by there, you're talking about Thomas Dimitrov and Scott Piola. They understand where the value is right now in this draft, getting physical, taking care of Matt Ryan, and we're going to win at the line of scrimmage. And to me, they're making a statement. A lot of teams are making that statement tonight. We're going to win up front. Look at what Green Bay's doing, All, what they did in free agency, what they did up front. You have to be able to control the line of scrimmage in this league. And I think a lot of teams, as much as we talk about Kyler Murray and the glamour position, if you win up front, you can win football games in this league. If you win up front, you protect your franchise quarterback. Yes. And speaking of franchise quarterback, there's one still in the green room who believes he can be a franchise quarterback. The Patriots are on the clock. Will it be Drew Locke? to New England, or will it be Drew Locke? Look at that hair, man. We'll Look at see that it hair. All. I love that hair. Listen, Look Book, you and I can't talk. Okay, you got it flung, baby. So will we see Drew go to New England, or will we see Drew tomorrow night? We'll find out. The draft, the first round, is coming to a close. Stay with us. Oh, sorry. We're not going anywhere. We're just watching that Patriot fan dance. So now, more importantly, do we think this is a guy that, that Bill Belichick would take a flyer on as a, the heir apparent? Well, you thought Daniel Jones, maybe. Duke, and you think about Tom Brady, and you think about the height. Drew Locke has the big-time arm. What Drew Locke has to work on is being more consistent with his down-the-field accuracy. Struggled in some games in that area. He didn't get a lot of help. That offensive line, you think about the Georgia game, he didn't have time to throw the ball against Georgia. They were getting after him. Kentucky game, it was too much with Josh Allen and that great secondary. So really, Missouri, when he struggled, it was because the receiver, Emmanuel Hall, was hurt. The offensive line couldn't block anybody. I thought the Florida game, down in Gainesville, made him a first-round pick. Right. Really made him a lot of money. He hadn't gone yet, but that game against that defense on the road, 75% completion, three touchdowns, and he rode that momentum the rest of the year. So I think Drew Locke, if he can just, he's a veteran, he's played a lot of college football, but those periods of inconsistency, I think, haunted him some. But he, he's got one thing going for him. Right. He's got that rocket arm. You know, Drew Locke yeah. could be the pick here, but, yeah. I mean, what's screaming from the Patriots? Gronkowski retires. I mean, we need a tight end. end. Irv Smith Jr., a versatile guy that can run. Yep. We know Tom Brady likes to work the middle of the field, and they need the pick. Irv Smith Jr. is just is like it's screaming right now. Yeah, Irv yeah. Smith, whose dad, by the way, was a first-round pick as well. Yes. Yeah, tight end for the New Orleans Saints. What jersey Saints was Belichick wearing at that throw day? <laughs> yeah, exactly hey, there, right. There we go. No, exactly. it, was, it, was just, it was a team-issued gear. He looked like he went to the equipment guy and said, here, give me a pullover. But Bill doesn't the, care. He's not... By the way, we talked about it at the start of the draft, right? Two teams could control this draft, the Raiders and the Giants. Well, they both end up with three first-round picks. First time ever in yeah. the common draft era, we've had two teams with three first-round picks. The Giants and the Raiders are those two teams. We'll see what they'll do with those picks going forward. But the final pick, 
of the last round is belonging to the champs, the New England Patriots. A lot of people thought they might trade out, as Bill Belichick has been wont to do. But no, ladies and gentlemen, that pick is in. Where is Bill Belichick going? With the 32nd pick in the 2019 NFL Draft, the New England Patriots select Nikhil Harry, wide receiver, Arizona State. <laughs> to all our fans here in Nashville, over 200,000 people attended tonight. Thank you for your passion. We'll see you all tomorrow night. That was the classic Patriot fan reaction. I have no idea who that is. Oh, it's a wide receiver. Okay, good. We got a wide receiver. Man, you, you, you are going for seven. And here is Nikhil Harry. Played his final year at Arizona State under our friend Herm Edwards. I talked to Herm extensively about this kid. He said he checked every single box. Does he play hard? Check. Does he show up for meetings and workouts? Check. Does he give you a competitor? Check. He does that. Big night here in Nashville. It's been a stellar night here in Nashville with plenty of fireworks and interesting twists and turns. And it ends up with a guy who's had a lot of twists and turns in his own life in Nikhil Harry. Uh, Nikhil Harry and his, was born in Toronto, Canada, but then his mom felt, wait, that's much colder than my home of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. However, then they decided his, Felda, his grandmother decided he needed to have an opportunity. So they moved to Arizona and then of course, they grew up in Chandler, Arizona, while his mother stayed in St. Vincent and Grenadine. Nikhil Harry has only been back a couple of times to St. Vincent and Grenadine. There he is, seeing his family on one of those visits back there. It's been an absolutely remarkable journey. His grandmother was about to retire from working for the government for St. Vincent and Grenadines and wanted to travel the world. And they said, no, he, she had an instant bond with Nikhil, and they moved together to Arizona. And this is Nikhil as a high school basketball player, and he could throw it down. By the way, even his girlfriend, Kiana Ibis, is also athletic. She's an Arizona State forward, and she might end up playing in the WNBA. As for Nikhil Harry, everyone knew he could catch the ball. Everyone knew he could go get it. There were concerns about his speed. He ran a decent enough time, Mel, at the 40, because he is a competitor for the ball. Yeah, 4 5 three. He's only been a kid almost 230 pounds, incredibly strong in the upper body, and very athletic, almost a 38, 40-inch vertical. You think about a kid here who can go get the deep ball because he's that power forward. Very good body control. On the underneath routes, he's got great ability to make yards after the catch. Here he is again, power forward, contested reception. I want to see him block a little better, be more consistent there. Route running is a little sporadic at times, but here he is. After after the catch, with the ball in his hands, the ability to make people miss, change direction, and then turn on the juice. He runs that 4-5-3, like I said, at nearly 230 pounds. Herm Edwards really like this kid, and Nikhil Harry has an opportunity, obviously, with the greatest of all time. Yeah, we'll see what he can do there. What you really like about him is that he's a three-position player. You saw him line up at X and Z. You saw him line up in the slot. You saw him take direct snaps in the Wildcat. Yep. He is big and strong and a guy who can get tremendous yardage after the catch. The jump of 50-50 balls, those back shoulder fades on the outside, he won those over and over. He put those big mitts on the defensive back. He would push off. He would give subtle forearm shivers. He's one of those guys who really, he complements what they don't have in New England. Makes sense for them. Look, New England hasn't always had the greatest like amount of success drafting and developing wide receivers, but I'll take my I'll take my odds with with this guy up there with Tom Brady for sure. Look, here's the deal. Uh, this is the first wide receiver the Patriots have taken in the first round 
since Terry Glenn out of Ohio State in 1996. Oh. This has been the longest drought of any team when it comes to taking a wide receiver in the first round. And it's obviously the first time since Bill, in Bill Belichick's era uh, in New England, pretty good era, sure. uh, that he has decided to go with a wide receiver in the first round. So the last two ends of the first round for the New England Patriots, last year they took the running back Sony Michelle out of Georgia. Safe to say Worked that out. went well for them. Sony Michelle was the only player to score a touchdown in Super Bowl 53 in their 13-3 win over the Rams. And now they take Nikhil Harry, and they've never taken a wide receiver in the first round before. You have to say, in Bill Belichick, you trust here, right? Absolutely. Look, you always give them the benefit of the doubt. And why do you do that? Because Bill is one of the best at developing players, and they have a quarterback in Tom Brady who's going to get you on the same page as him, or he's going to get you out of there, or Bill's going to get you out of there. This is, again, how you build wide receiver cores. They have to match up with one another. You kill Harry makes sense for them. So what did we say at the beginning of this, right? It was going to be the Raiders and the Giants, and the Raiders and the Giants absolutely controlled this draft. The Giants ended up with a third pick as the fireworks display is really good. That's the <laughs> grand finale. That would be your grand finale right there. So the Raiders got their three, and then you have the Giants with their three. It has been a fantastic night. Thanks for watching the first round of the draft. Don't forget, we're coming back again Friday and then all day Saturday to go through all the picks for Booger McFarland, Lewis Riddick, and the Mel Kuyper Jr. I'm Trey Wingo. Thanks for watching the first round of the draft. Stay tuned. Coming up next on ESPN, it's SportsCenter.